extend it. So these are some of the recent developments which the government is uh, doing. Now coming to the objective to make a comparison in government uh, schools where we find that schools under government undertaking model schools which are following BSE syllabus are taking initiative for regular classes following a of five classes daily though with flexible timing yeah i would like to mention that basically the students who uh, learn in these uh, government schools their parents are working as laborers or some are mothers are nurses so they have their daily schedule so that is their teachers they take their classes from seven evening till 11 30 night and they are working really very hard to support this group of uh, private students and their monitoring is directly under rastriya majamik siksha abhiyan office through a common whatsapp then coming to the cdc board schools the schools are are found less involved in this process of daily classes. They were monitored by school inspectors of every district. District wise, some variations, although may be found by most of the district where I have interviewed, that they were trying to support the students to their own initiative. There is a problem that uh, many of the students they don't have this uh, and my mobile phone and as a result it becomes very difficult and as such the teachers are uh, over phone contacting the who are obviously and it becomes very difficult for the teachers to reach all the students whereas in case of the private schools are also offering five classes daily to the students various, uh, various forms may be found among students but the pandemic evidently placed the difference between rural and our schools along with children of poor and well-to-do families. School closures impact on the issues that this only 70% of students from both urban as well as rural and uh, areas can be covered and of the students are due to digital divide. Secondary children, both the urban and rural students which economic background do not invite more and moreover they do not have the money to buy a net pick again due to lack of electricity they have to travel from their remote uh, you know rural areas to the towns to recharge their mobile phones for the uh, classes to pay for the and one more thing that in one family suppose there are three uh, children they are st uh, studying one one in and as a result, it becomes very difficult to share more well for their own learning. And these are some of the problems which they have expressed to me. And further, they have said that since they do not have a WhatsApp number. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. They have a WhatsApp reminder as well. Thank you. Okay. Further, uh, see, they don't have the WhatsApp number. They will share the WhatsApp number of maybe their uncles who are residing in Bangladesh, as we all know was a gun in some in the area. Sometimes a teacher's day will over phone contact the person residing in Bangladesh regarding the educational practices of his nephew or other relatives. And this is how they were managing. First is uh, of foods in pretty lack of nutrition that government is providing midday meal and which are being distributed but would be difficult to receive them. In the child related problem where the parents due to lack of education and uh, due to their illiteracy status, they find it very difficult to cope with trend of online learning. And further physical inactivity on that a few students were little upset due to distancing from their friends, their relatives, and moreover, children are not finding adequate scope for outdoor sports and co-curricular activities. So these are some issues. And positive are making both students and teachers more techno-friendly and ICT, in ICT applications. They are getting habituated with GeoMeet, GeoChat, as the government is asking the teachers as well as to and they are working in this uh, process of online learning and they uh, uh, taking on this educational exercise. They were encouraging uh, participants and interactions who 
earlier reduction in classroom involvement or completing homework on time. Many of them noticeably apply electronic social presentation of their soft skills and other innovative activities. And the government is organizing some of the uh, activities like uh, recitation competition for the benefit of the students. So in conclusion, let me tell you that this plan has been frequently adapted by education institutions all around the world. Both the government and private educational institutions are taking initiative to reach the continuing education exercise. It is disheartening that online devices cannot encompass the students to the entire nation, but a sizable portion of the parents of the students express their trepidation for excessive use of laptop and mobile phone by the world. And in spite of all the positive effort from the social authorities, the pandemic has really put the entire education system into a jeopardy. Thank you very much. Have a very nice day. Have a very good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Now, thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Azinta for her presentation. A very good morning. Dr. Gautam as well to get ready after this. Welcome. Okay. A very good morning to one and all present here. Can you see me and can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, please. It's clear. Thank you. Okay. I would uh, like to know what is the time allotted to me? Uh, six minutes. So. Six minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I would like to share my screen as we have very less time. Mm. Okay, so uh, this is the topic. Uh, it's a micro study on the impact of lockdown on the students' behavior and perceptions with particular reference to students of Handy Girls College, Guwahati, Assam. And I myself work in that college. Now, the introduction, a very impactful and all encompassing event to be recorded in history and in the world in the recent times is undoubtedly the coronavirus pandemic. It has challenged the governments of different countries in its governance capacity, uh, public health infrastructure, as well as network of frontline workers. And that includes not only doctors, but also policemen and other uh, municipality workers to the ultimate level. The job prospects have become out, downright shaky. The employment opportunities grim. The economy has been literally flattened. And most important for those in the higher education sector like us, the final year students face a hazy future ahead. Now, what were my objectives? I'm rather rushing through this because the time is less. The objectives are, the primary objective was basically to find out the actual situation with respect to the students, the, the impact the lockdown has on the students. And it also aimed to find out if there are any psychological issues or implications attached to it. And the secondary objective was to analyze the students' perceptions and attitude towards online teaching. Now the need and importance cannot be overemphasized. We all know that. This is an extraordinary situation where overnight we had a transition from face-to-face -face teaching to online teaching and none of us were prepared for this, neither students nor teachers. And in, in, in such a situation, it is always important for us to stop, pause, introspect and analyze where we are in a present position because that will direct us to our next turning point or the next level so that we may provide a quality education to our college level students. It will also let us know where we have our lapses or gaps. Now the methodology has been to conduct a primary study on the students of the Department of Economics of Handy Girls College, which is one of uh, the premier colleges for women's education in this part of the country. Uh, for this, uh, we select a sample of more than a uh, little more than 15% of the universe. The universe is basically my department, consisting of more, around 350 students. 
So questionnaires were distributed online to be reverted back. Simple statistical tools were used for finding and secondary sources were used, but they were limited because this is a primary study mainly. Now the respondents uh, background is that mostly were uh, second semester, fourth and sixth semester students. And uh, they were in the age group, say 18 to 22 years. And uh, I uh, actually in my questionnaire, I have many things, but uh, here I'll be showing only a few. Uh, these two bars show uh, the actual number and the percentage. So what was the response to lockdown? We find that uh, many were worried, worried. More than 75% were very worried when the lockdown was announced and a few around um, say 12 of them were frank and they said they were happy when it was announced because it meant holidays for them and the others were uh, negligible effects. Now the perceived if they effect on life, how did they feel it will affect their, uh, their academic life, overall life, their social life and their family life. So 30% of them, this shows their, their perceived effect on their academic life. And I must say this belong to the final year students. And the others, the mostly the majority felt that it will affect all aspects of their life. Now regarding their, the preference for a particular format of online teaching. Now, before I go to that, I must say, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Purovi's presentation where she said that we uh, have seen that the children had us, uh, the, the college going children, the girls, they have accepted this whole thing very well. It's the positive effect. So they have accepted the online teaching. However, they were a bit skeptical when, when it was asked whether they think that will it be possible if lockdown continues can we continue have a full semester's course in this way? They were a bit skeptical about that. Now, regarding the format type they want, uh, I gave them various options. That which would you prefer? Live classes through Zoom, Skype, Webex, etc., Cisco Webex, tutorials, YouTube on G Classroom, or uh, like that many. So many of them opted for the all. That means a combination of all and uh, video and audio clips, I mean, sorry, video and tutorials were also preferred, it is shown here. So the 32%, you can say this and this, were uh, for video and uh, tutorials. Now the vibes fell during lockdown. I asked him, what do you think have been the positive, negative vibes? So they said that the vibes have been uh, mostly 40%, that is 20 of the girls said that they felt negative vibes. Others didn't feel anything as such. And some very minuscule percent felt both at times. Similarly, emotional ups and downs, I find that sometimes, this sometimes constantly, rarely, never, uh, the sometimes uh, the factor came the, had to be the highest. So they do have their emotional uh, ups and downs during the whole period of lockdown. Now, respondents with regard to thought about their future. So regarding thought about their future, I uh, found that they felt that the, their uh, future would be affected the career. This shows the career and this shows uh, all aspects of their future. And these two are uh, the other aspects like uh, so social, family, others, uh, finances, etc. So again, here this was reported by majority of the final year students that they felt they had worries about the future in the way of their academics because they wanted to pursue their studies and they did not know they do not know till now where they will go. Now, the ways of tackling negativity, I gave them th some uh, choices. And I find that these girls who are mostly in their teens or just out of it, up to 22 years, these girls were, uh, you know, uh, facing the problem head on. And they were uh, having the maximum girls who benefited from having extra interests. That is hobbies and craft. 
uh, uh, even familial was uh, support in the way of talking to people in the family music and dance all these helped them to tackle the negativity to tackle the ups and downs which they had in their lives and now the findings and conclusions uh, do 60 percent of the percent of the respondents had heard about COVID, yet more than 70 percent felt quite worried when the lockdown was announced in March. Majority were concerned that it will affect all aspects of their life, especially their academic life. The impression whether the institution was reaching out to them was positive, but many felt that reaching out to all was not possible because some were located in very rural areas where network was not good. Though more than half of the participants in the survey felt a preference for online teaching, yet such a mode as a way of teaching uh, they did not prefer. This was in the context of possible extension of lockdown of educational institutions. Some felt negative vibes, were indifferent, but they were indeed experiencing emotional ups and downs thoughts about the career, but in spite of being so young, they appeared to give their attention to tackling the negativity through various ways and means, importance of hobbies, music and dance, and even the mobile phone, the gadgets, assumed greater significance. And the aftermath of news, I did ask them this question also, that when did you feel bad after hearing TV news about all the deaths? So it did produce a feeling of despondency in them, but the good part is, uh, part is the morbid thoughts didn't come to too many minds as a result of that. So these are the views of some students which I asked. And I would like to end with Mayuri, Mayuraki Kolitas, that the current condition is more of an uncertainty to me, uncertainty about my dreams, normalcy, and life. Every day, waking up and looking at the death rate has taken a toll, no matter how much we try, there is always a fear. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ajinta. Yes. For a wonderful presentation. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Gautam Barua, and after that, Dr. Prati Das to get ready as well. Dr. Gautam? Yes, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Yes, please. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, good evening, ma'am. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my paper in this uh, great international conference. And I also thank the organizing committee for organizing such a, a nice international conference. And also uh, to the participants who have presented so nice presentation. So today, myself, uh, Gautam Burua, uh, Assistant Professor, University Law College. And today I am going to present uh, my paper on COVID-19, uh, whether it is a curse or blessing in disguise to the education sector in Assam. Uh, in preparing my paper, I have followed the doctrinal method of study. And while following this method, I have gone through various newspapers, magazines, and various online sources in preparing the paper. And regarding the objective of my paper, I just want to know what is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and various situations prevailing in the, uh, Assam and its impact on the education sector, and what remedies can be given to solve this problem. Uh, as we all know that uh, COVID-19 pandemic has created havoc throughout the world, not only in economic sector, but in all sectors. Education is also greatly affected by this uh, pandemic. Uh, as of now, nearly 1.6 crore people have been infected by this uh, dreaded virus. And near about 6.6 .6 lakhs people have died throughout the world. In India also, about 15 lakhs people have been infected by this uh, disease and uh, near about 33,500 people have died in India also. In Assam also, there are about 35,000 people who have been infected by this disease. Considering the, considering the grief situation, 
the government of Assam as well as government of India has declared nationwide lockdown on 24th of March 2020. But uh, Prior to this, in the earlier part of March, all the educational institutions in Assam has been closed to, for the sake of uh, health of the student community. Now, as per a report of UNESCO, if educational institutions are closed for a longer period of time, it not only affects the students community, but it greatly impacts the community also. There is about 48,000 uh, uh, upper and lower primary school in Assam and about 5,000 uh, private schools. Moreover, there are about 4,500 high schools run by the government under SEBA and other central schools and private schools also. There are about 23 universities and there are hundreds of colleges affiliated under these colleges. So if we, you can consider how much the students' future have been impacted by this close down. Now, as per this in this course report, if uh, educational institutions are closed for a longer period of time, it will not only affect the educational development of the student, but it mostly affect the poor section of the students. Nowadays, food is provided in schools, not only in Assam, all over the India. As the schools have been locked down, educational institutions have been locked down, this food is not provided to the poor students. And in this case, their nutrition is compromised. Moreover, when schools will be open, after a longer period of closure, the dropout rate will be increased. And during this period, because they are poor students engage in various economic activities, and after that, they lost interest in studying and it prevents them from coming back to school. This also is a effect of longer closure of educational institution. Moreover, during this close period, uh, some poor students may be recruited by insurgent groups or terrorists also. Uh, minor marriages increases, sexual assault in increases during this period. So these are some negative effects of longer closure of educational institutions. To, of this, uh, to prevent such kind of uh, situation, some government has taken various laudable steps. They have uh, launched some programs like uh, e-Diksa, e-Patsala, uh, Soyam Prabha, National Digital Library, through which students can at least uh, forward their syllabus and uh, they get the uh, development, the opportunity in educational and academic career. Moreover, government had also asked all the private and uh, government school teachers to uh, conduct online classes from their part. And it is seen that most of the teachers are involved in uh, giving students online classes through various platforms like Google Meet, Zoom, uh, Google Classroom, etc. Those do have some controversy yet. Um, nowadays also people is using Zoom as well as Google Meet for giving uh, online classes to the students. Now, the question arises whether uh, this facility, which is given by these uh, school teachers as well as government, is available to all the students. As per a report of UNESCO, only 24% of the uh, Indian population has access to internet connectivity. And as per report in Assam, only about 40% people can access internet connectivity. So what about the rest of the 60%? How their education will be continued or how they will progress? What will be their future? So that is the question in this regard. Though government has taken some welcome step by relaxing fees of students for admission into next academic session and as per the decision of the authority, uh, government, Assam government has promoted the students of this academic session to the next academic session, except the final year students or final semester students, so that their academic uh, career is not destroyed. Moreover, the Assam government has shifted the academic calendar 
for the sake of for the interest of the student and from january to december to april to march so these are some steps taken by government to protect the interests of the students but those online initiatives have been taken by teachers and government but it is not reaching to the uh, all the students in this regard uh, one decision of the telangana high court on a pil petition filed by hyderabad school parents association regarding online providing online education in this case uh, the telangana high court pointed out that the online connections or online facilities are not available to people residing in rural areas or remote areas or tribal areas so these people are deprived of these online classes therefore they have asked to the telangana government to prepare a detailed report how they will conduct classes online classes for those students re residing in those remote area or tribal area similar is the case with uh, assam government also in assam government in this period of the year there is flood and erosion about 28 districts of assam is suffering from flood people they are not able to live in their houses they have to come out from their house because of flood they are residing in uh, relief camps national highway they are not even getting proper food there there is no electricity then the students of those areas how they will be able to avail the online classes so these are some problems which are faced nowadays in assam uh, though covid 19 pandemic is going on and in urban areas students are able to access online classes but in rural and uh rural areas they are not able to access those things therefore this creates problem for them no doubt uh there are various schemes of government and in this regard uh people should come forward and uh, they should be more made aware that by taking some steps they can avail these online facilities but it is not to be done it cannot be done in near future it is it will take longer time government has to take initiatives and not only government some private uh, cor big corporations like uh, reliance jio airtel vodafone they have to come forward so that internet connectivity is uh, provided to rural areas also electricity is provided in rural areas also in affordable prices then only these initiatives of online classes will be beneficial to the uh, students of rural all the students 100% students but it is in the time please ma'am okay ma'am i'm confusing uh, uh so every hurdle every problem brings with some new opportunity uh, history also speaks about that the bubonic plague which uh, was which happened in 14th century in europe it completely wiped out half of the population in that area and but it created a uh, scarcity of labor in that time because of which uh, the cost of labor and wages of labor also increased this increased their living standard their increased their purchasing power so they started purchasing luxurious products like uh, paintings ornaments artworks and this eventually resulted in uh, renaissance renaissance in the 15th century similar is the case with covid 19 in assam also if we take it as opportunity now people were uh, teachers were reluctant for uh, before pandemic teachers were reluctant to use online tools in educating students but as they have been compelled now it has become a part and parcel of uh, providing education to students so future will be such that it will be a blend of both this offline and online classes so we really hope that after covid 19 pandemic there will be a better opportunity for students as well as teachers sure. uh, and ma'am 
Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Sorry about the time, but yes. Oh, uh, but uh, as of now, there are some practical problems. Uh, we cannot provide rural people immediately electricity or connectivity, but for this, we can avail the available sources that is television and radio by which uh, government can uh, organize some programs which will be uh, oriented towards syllabus of different classes students which will be available or which will be uh, obtainable by the rural students of the village. Uh, moreover, uh, when schools open, then we have to maintain, it will not, uh, we cannot say when the vaccine of COVID-19 will hit the market, but till now we cannot keep the schools closes. For, therefore, for reopening the schools, we have to take some strategy. We have to make multiple sections of the classes, multiple uh, period for classes, multiple question paper for so, so you, that, Yes, ma'am. Social distancing is maintained. Uh, therefore, we can say that the, at conclusion, we can say that uh, COVID-19 pandemic, though it is a curse, yet it is a blessing in disguise. Thank you, ma'am. For sure, for sure. Thank you. Sorry about the time. We have to respect that as well. Okay. All right. So now I would like to welcome Dr. Prabhupada Das. And I would like to request Dr. Nipon Kumar to be ready as well. Dr. Prabhupada Das. Hello, madam. Hello, madam. Yes, yeah, I think uh, Prapti does is not available. Oh, okay. uh, move, yeah, yeah, move to the next one. Sure. Then I would like to welcome Dr. Nip uh, Nipam Kumar, please. Are you there? Uh, please ensure me whether I am audible or not. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Yeah, we are hearing you. Thank you so much. A uh, very thank all of you. Respected chair, respected coordinator of Gokhai Gao College, and all my esteemed participating colleagues. I'm Dr. Nipom Kumar Hoykia, assistant professor in the Department of English, Vishwanath College, Ahom. My paper is about the role of I'm not hearing. Hello, Soikia. Dr. Nipon Kumar Soikia. We are not hearing. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Looks like we. we yeah. Him. Yeah, yeah. I think there is a yeah. network problem. Can I start, Adam? Yes, please. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am very, very sorry for the network issue. Network. Yeah. My paper will be on the role of great literature in a world affected by COVID. Now we all know that so many people are affected by this pandemic in different parts of the world. And it's like there's a problem. Like there's a problem with the internet. 
But internship never happen now. My turn is happening. Am I good? It's not very clear. I'm sorry. Now? Yes, yes. It's okay now. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, we all know. Don't know why it is happening. So we all know that we are all affected by the COVID mentally. My focusing point is that if someone is terribly sensitive to the fact that at any point of time he or she may fall a very easy victim to the virus that is COVID-19, life really becomes horrible for him or her. In fact, his or her suffering, that means the person who is all the time suffers from the panic of death that any point of time he may fall and is the victim to COVID. Life becomes horrible for him. And therein lies the role of literature. We are living in a technological age and the technology has literally made this world a global village, but the technology has miserably failed to unite us mentally. And the result we see that there are so many conflicts across the world. If there is any amount of unity which is prevailing among us, it's because of the role being played by literature since time immemorial. Therefore, in this pandemic situation, the government, or academic institutions, the policymakers should think of creating an ideal atmosphere for cultivating the habit of reading great literary text. Now, definitely the question comes that how the illiterate masses can read this great literary text. Now, my point is that in there, are, in, there are different parts you know, in Assam where uh, this movie, open air cinema show is still going on. If that can be arranged for the entertainment of the working class people, why can't we create an atmosphere of storytelling session in mass level? We have to select the stories from the great literary text and we have to invite some experts and they can tell those stories of the great text to the common people. And in the process, the perspective of those common people will be broadened. So, literature can really play a very important role in making people positive, in making them realize the values of life. This COVID has made us realize that the assets of humanity are not the skyrocketing building, not the nuclear atom bomb, but love, compassion, and respect. In a twinkling of an eye, we have seen how United States of America has become weaker than the poor Somalia. 
So literature paves the way for us to realize the things which are very, very essential for life, irrespective of time, irrespective of age. Now, in this regard, let me talk about the present age. This is the age of online. This is the age of social media. This is the age of you know, so many digital texts. We are very much addicted to uh, the reading of the Facebook post, the video clips, the audio clips. My dear friends, let me tell you that this is just the carnal reading. This is a kind of superficial reading. This can never be the substitute for reading great literary text. And I have been very repeatedly using the word great. Now let me clarify what I mean by great literary, I mean great literature. By great literature, I mean those literary texts that address the matters of enduring importance that have universal appeal across all the cultures that are written in a dignified language and that make us realize the higher truth of life. Now, let me take a point in case. We all know the novel, The Play, written by Albert Camus, who got the Nobel Prize. It was written in 1947. Now, this novel can be taken as an example of pandemic literature. This novel can also be taken as an example of a great literary text. I'm not going to tell each and every aspects of the novel in detail. Just I would like to tell you the crux of it. Now in the novel, the central, I mean, the protagonist is, hello. In a novel, the protagonist is Dr. Rio. He's a doctor. And in the city of Wuhan, a French province, all of a sudden, people got affected by a plague. The death toll started rising and Dr. Rio relentlessly battle against this disease, despite knowing the fact that he cannot stop it. It has already become unstoppable. So he can stop fighting against it. Now, if he continues his fight against the disease, there is every possibility that he will contract the disease. If he stops fighting against this, again, there is every possibility that he will contact the disease. I mean, contract the disease. It is a choice between date and date, not date and life. And Dr. Rio decides decisively to continue his fight against the disease because he realizes that if he continues his fight against this disease, this comes. And when the big crisis comes, we say that this crisis has come all of a sudden in an unprecedented way. Let me tell you, my dear friends, that any pandemic, any plague, it comes to us without prior notice. In fact, this is very natural. It doesn't come without prior notice. Therefore, Thomas Hartley rightly says that we, our life is actually full of pain. It is a drama full of pain, and happiness comes. So one plague is over, we should be prepared for other plague. Uh, looks like we lost him again, and because of the time constraint, I think we would have to move move ahead. Hello. <laughs> looks like I'm yeah. audible now, madam. Am I audible now, madam? Hello. Uh, Am I audible now? Yes, yes. Okay. Because the network is disturbing a lot, let me come to the conclusive point that Albert Camus in his novel, The Play, urges us to accept all the challenges of life. It will be a crisis, it will be a small crisis, life is a crisis. Life is a drama again where happiness comes. Therefore, it is part of life. Literature, great literature is the best train for life. Literature. 
I think we would have to stop here. We do time. Yes, madam. Yes, madam. Yeah. yeah, move to the next one. Sorry about that, yeah. Hello. Uh, Hello. Dr. Kumar, I think we are moving ahead. I'm sorry. Madam, conclusion point. Let me come to the conclusion point. Hello, madam. Could you please try to do it quickly? We are moving, we are running out of time and yeah, due to technology. Okay, okay, okay. I can understand, but I'm very super on issue. I would like to complete my paper by referring to one of the stanzas of a very small poem written by stream. I think we would have to move. Yeah, 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 yeah. it's right. Uh, sorry about that. So I think we would have to move ahead now. And I would like to welcome Dr. Ranjumi. Yeah, okay. yeah the, he caught the sound. I'm so sorry. Dr. Das, is Dr. Ranjumi there? Doctor, yeah. Can I please welcome Doctor Ranjumethi, please? I understand. Okay. 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 I, I am here. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, madam. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good afternoon to one and all. Am I audible? Yes. Yes, please. Yes, yes. Respected Go chairperson ahead. and particip all the participants here. Today I'm going to present my paper on impact of COVID-19 and COVID-19 and its impact on the education sector. Introduction, the most recent sometimes referred to as the novel coronavirus is called COVID-19 and was first detected in Wuhan, China in December of 2019. Since its first cases in China, COVID-19 has spread to almost every country worldwide. The alarming spread of the virus caused the havoc in the education system, forcing educational institutions to shut down. This is a crucial time for the education sector, board examinations, nursery school admission, entrance tests of various universities, and competitive examinations, among others, are all held during this period. This paper is mainly based on to investigate the impacts of formal closures of schools and universities on education. Based on the analysis of secondary sources data and published news commentaries, the article reviews the global situations and reflects on the nature of in effect of the COVID-19 on education. It highlights some of the challenges and offers some strategies to combat the impacts of the pandemic. The impact of the COVID-19 on school education. Various countries have adopted a range of measures to respond to the pandemic depending on their available resources. For instance, countries which are technologically advanced such as Italy, France, Germany, Australia, the UK, and the US have adopted distance learning as a means to compensating for the loss. They quickly enhanced their e-learning platform. To create common distance learning center, 
portals and provided students access to e-content and repository through mobile devices. The other hand, countries without adequate infrastructures are turning to traditional technologies such as radio and TV as a means to compensate for the loss. Impact of learning and skill development. <clears throat> the COVID-19 closures have a negative impact on students' knowledge and skill development. The present scenario indicates that students are affected differently by the pandemic. For instance, a few schools and colleges in urban areas have started to run online classes to mitigate the impact on learning. However, running online classes does not seem to be visible at most rural schools. High dropouts. The COVID-19 school closures is likely to increase dropout rates. It is estimated that the COVID-19 impact on education might resemble the impact of Ebola epidemic in Africa, which significantly increased dropout rates across you know, Liberia and Sierra Leone countries arrested by the outbreak. Strategies to respond to COVID-19 impact on the school education. There are some indications that the impact of COVID-19 where many people live below the poverty line is going to be devastating. It is highly likely that some children from low-income parents never return to school when schools reopen as they must support their families. The COVID-19 pandemic has a serious impact on health and well-being of young people. It is likely that Mental health problems are increasing and many more children have become a victim of domestic violence. Impact on assessment. All sorts of external examinations, including board exams, such as the secondary education examinations like this, have been postponed and almost all the internal assessments have been cancelled. The cancellation of assessments have negative impact on students' learning. Internal assessments are very important as they indicate students' learning needs and then support learning. Regarding the external assessment, their postponement has a direct impact on students as the educational and occupational future of students depend on their outcomes. All of this might have indirect effect on their learning. A proper plan and remedial actions in hand to face the the lenses will be needed. Policy suggestions. In this time of crisis, a well-rounded and effective educational practice is needed for the capacity building of young minds. Online classes have become the most suitable solution to secure a continuous rise in education. And this is possible by adopting various practices such as use of video broadcasting tools, video Broadcasting includes virtual learning like recording, live video, audio, via, via mobile app or website. The government should support schools and universities to strengthen their capacity to run online classes. Students also need support to get access to internet and technology as most students cannot afford. During this pandemic as well, it is highly important that schools make a frequent contact with students and parents. There might be several ways to do so, such as telephone call, contact through social media, and home visits, maintaining a physical distance. Conclusion. It is evident that the COVID-19 pandemic has created some sort of educational anarchy with the government having no firm grip of educational system. If proper actions are not taken on time, the whole education system will be stagnant or even collapse. A task force on education in its province needs to be set up under the leadership of the relevant ministry to explore possibilities such as immediate and short-term measures and enable teachers to compensate for the loss. Since the majority of students have almost no access to technology, the new measures must capitalize on low tech courses and also provide some e-learning platforms to those students who have access to technology. Thank you. Okay. 
हेलो 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 एम आई ऑडिबल यस 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 Oh, my name is Bonosri Devi from Narengi Anselik Mahavidyalaya. The uh, topic of my paper is a global pandemic in the global pandemic and its impact on the Indian educational system. Can you see my presentation? Yes, yes, it is feasible. Yeah. You can go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, the topic of my paper is global pandemic and its impact on the Indian education system. Myself, Bonosri Devi from Narendra Gandhi. The world faces great threat from the traceless virus named SARS-CoV-2, which has been the source of life-threatening disease called COVID-19 or the coronavirus disease. So far, no medicine or vaccine has been discovered to tackle the contagion. And therefore, in order to contain the spread of the disease, government all across the world are adopting measures like lockdown, curfew, quarantine. Many educational institutions have also been shut down by the state to prevent the spread of infection among the students. This has compelled both the students and the teachers to embrace alternatives like online classes. The objective of my paper are to discuss about number one, the global repercussion of COVID-19 on education faced by the students, the negative impact of the COVID-19 on students, the positive impact of the pandemic on educational system of India. Along with this, I also put certain suggestions to cope up this problem. Then, um, as per the UNICEF report, 98.5% students are being affected by the global uh, close down of the educational institutions, especially differently able students who need special care along with the economically backward kids, they suffered a lot. The recent crisis has increased the chances of reserves in the behavior of the youngsters. Official statements have stated that there are over 35 core students in India. According to a study by Smile Foundation conducted by 23 states of India, uh, uh, over 43.99% surveyed students have access to smartphones while the rest of 53.09% are struggling to have one. As the popular saying goes, an idle mind is the devil's workshop to keep uh, engage our students in your academics, schools and colleges are shifting to the online platform. However, non-availability of mobile networks still stands as a barrier that is yet to be caused. Also, we can't ignore the health-related problems that arise from long-time use of smartphones and computers. Students are also facing many mental health problems in the pandemic after being abruptly distanced from the schools, teachers, friends, and academics. There has been a grim increase in the psychological problem of the students like stress, irritability, restlessness, anger, etc. There is also a high chance in student dropping of online classes compared to the traditional ones. Online classes are furthermore not completely reliable for imparting efficient practical skills to the students. In addition to it, it does not help in establishing close teacher-student bond, which was one of the merit of traditional classes. To make up for the loopholes in the system, the government need to make provisions to ensure better infrastructure, high-speed internet, good internet connectivity, 
but without adequate funds, all these won't be able to start. The recent lockdown have also gave rise to an uncertainty over holding the exams, as a result of which many educational boards had to span the exam plans midway. Students' internship and placement are also getting affected due to the pandemic. Many part-time and ad hoc teachers had to lose their jobs after the shutdowns. Uh, we can see the negative impact of the pandemic uh, um, on online. Uh, that is the life situation we have experienced today itself when uh, the bad weather created a problem for starting this meeting also. So these are the various negative impact of the pandemic uh, online classes. Uh, so now I'm going to discuss about the positive impact of the COVID-19. Digital learning has been exposed by teachers as an alternative since it has no physical boundaries, hence allowing the students to make best use of it. It has reduced the teacher's absenteeism. Online classes are being also held for activities like uh, games, uh, art, yoga. Students with poor health conditions are also able to attend classes. Absence of traditional classroom led to invention of new techniques of the teaching. Government has also been compelled to develop new application to assist the online teaching. Now, suggestions, I put some suggestions also. Students should focus on their studies and try to avail the maximum benefit from online classes. Government need to initiate good in his, uh, internet connectivity uh, in the private areas. NGOs can also lend a helping hand by either financially helping the students by making requisite arrangement for them. Both parents and teachers should interact with the students and provide them with counseling when necessary. Students should be stripped of sufficient sleep, nutritious food, and should always practice yoga and other exercise for their holistic well-being. With social distancing, proper facilities, and suitable planning to, uh, in schools, we can consider a reopening of schools. No exam should be conducted, keeping in mind of the student who would be not able to, um, or who would lose during this, uh, lose during this time. Now I'm come to the conclusion. We can say that online education can never be a permanent because alternative to traditional, it is the alternative to traditional classroom. Removing that uh, technology cannot ripple the teachers. UCC chairman, Dr. Busan Kotwarden in a webinar stated that our education should never be made automatic. It is true that internet can provide us with information, but really, Education can only be provided by the teachers. We can conclude with the words of Benjamin Franklin, who said that, tell me, I forget, teach me, I remember, involve me, I learn. Hence, um, with the direct involvement of the students, we cannot get a real educated person in real sense of the term. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Now I would like to welcome our final presenter, uh, Dr. Uttam, with his paper, please. Challenges of e-learning in the rural areas of Assam. Welcome, Dr. Uttam. Thank you, ma'am. Am I audible, ma'am? Uh, yes. So, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, please. Hello. Yes. Okay. Very uh, good afternoon to all. Honorable Chairperson, Dr. Sili Jindupani, Texas Women University, USA, guest speaker, Professor Dwin from UK, and Professor Ramsaran Patok, Tribuman University, Nepal, and Professor Taibur Rahman, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, and Dr. Dinesh Das and his team, and all the participants from all over the world. Uh, this is a joint paper. Uh, I am Dr. Uttam Kolita, with the geography from Kodabiri College and Bijudaka. Uh, she is working in the junior college of 
for everybody in the Department of Education. My topic is challenges of e-learning in the rural areas of Assam. Actually, uh, I am focusing in my paper on the rural sector. What is happening? What are the challenges in the rural areas? As you all know that due to COVID pandemic, the entire world has been suffering and particularly the education sector. Uh, I am focusing my attention in the state of Assam. Assam in northeastern part of India, with an extension of 4 degree north and 28 north, 18 and 90 degree east, is a backward and bridge of supply. In the area of 78 square kilometers, with a population 3.11 crore as on 2011 census. About 85.90% of the total population that are living in the rural areas and only 14.10% those are living in the urban areas. So uh, that is a completely a rural look of the state. There are 26,395 villages and 100 in the state and 3,875 villages are unrectified. So this is the situation in India. 31.16% of in the Arabs, but in Assam, all 14%. So that is a deplorable situation. The rural area new infrastructure, good activity in terms of facility, building water infrastructure, and Did we lo did you lose Dr. Uttam? Please hello. go ahead. Hello. Yes, please, please go ahead. Hello. On. Yeah. Okay. Uh, some problems are going on. Okay. Uh, so this is the panel explaining classes. So what's news in secondary school? And both descriptive and analytical approach are applied. I have very much dealt uh, during two, two months uh, conducting online, but my experiences, just I want to share that have You see, electrification and online mode of learning. What is the relationship between electric and online mode of learning? As on statistical handbook of Assam, 2013. The problem continues. I'm sorry, but yeah, we are running out of time and there is a problem somewhere. So, yeah, please go ahead. You are Hello. cutting out. Madam, Hello. Yes, you are cutting out. Yeah, Hello. Go ahead. Hello, ma'am. Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, okay. So, see, it is an 807 village still to see the light. is the only source of light here. And in Assam, 2,503 villages are yet to be connected with mobile network towers. So the problem is that economic condition and e-learning, another problem, poor economic condition leads to frustrations among some students. The poor parents could not provide the Android phones, Android mobile phones or laptops to their sons and daughters. Ultimately, they had to face uh, frustrations and Suicide case also 
reported due to frustrations for not being unable to uh, buy a mobile phone to conduct uh, to receive the classes from their teachers online classes so that is one of the problem in rural areas due to poor economic conditions the parents could not provide their sons and daughters the modern devices or the uh, that is digital device so that is one problem in the rural areas next lack of skill in handling smart tools madam am i audible yes you are Hello. clear sir but yeah we have okay. a couple more minutes Another very important problem is that in Assam there are 48,000 gov and lower primary and upper primary schools, 2,050 to higher secondary schools recognized by SEBA, 23 universities, both other central, state, and state universities, and 305 colleges, and many more privately run institutions. Millions of students are enrolled, and thousands of teachers are engaged in these educational institutions. The problem is that. many of the teachers they are not accustomed with this new tools to handle so that is a great problem and many of the students are also they are not actually uh, knowing to how to handle uh, the smart tools so that is a problem uh, before going to launch this online mode of teaching so teachers should be trained first to handle this uh, modern tools that is one problem limitations in practical classes so it is very problem to conduct the practical classes like the to physics chemistry mathematics uh, sorry geology and in some other subjects also and basically in engineering and medical uh, courses it is not practical it is not effective so that is also another problem other challenges the vernacular medium all the apps are in that is english languages so the uh, that is not available uh, in the local or vernacular languages so it is also a problem for the students and sometimes for the teachers also visibility and attendance so uh, uh, we could not uh, just uh, see the attendance of the students if the students attending the class uh, he can mute his video or sometimes uh, that is audio also and he may go to some other places or may a room also here and there so Uh, ultimately teacher could not know about his attendance uh, so that is the problem also a uh, group activity is absent so in online mode of teaching uh, we uh, don't see the group activity that is the self learning is also another problem peer cooperation is not visible that is another problem the eye contact development of love and affection are lost so that is very important point in education to have a proper education there should be eye contact between students and teachers development of love and affections are there so that is completely lost in online mode of teaching so that is another problem conclusion all the villages of assam not connect with electrification which is a major concern for e learning this is the concluding part so before studying before starting the online mode of teaching learning method the all the villages should be electrified properly next year with more can you hear me ma'am yes thank you hello. thank you hello ma'am okay a large number of villages yet fit with mobile towers another problem that connected with the mobile network towers to have the online mode of teaching or learning the poor economic condition of some of the rural households discouraged the students for online learning the parents of these households could not provide smartphone laptop or computer to their sons and daughters which leads to frustration some of the teachers are not familiar with these ict tools which leads to unsuccessful of the e learning impractical practical in engineering and medical science and practical classes in subjects like physics chemistry zoology for all on development of the students the traditional classroom teaching is the best mode so uh, traditional classroom is the best mode though we are now following or adopting the online mode of uh, teaching my suggestion strong infrastructure in electrification must be given priority and it should be certain that no village is left out of electricity besides regular supply of electricity is also major concern each and every corner of the state 
must be well connected with internet connectivity for this success of e-learning. The students from poor economic background should be provided with smartphones free of cost so that they are not deprived of digital learning. Before launching digital mode of teaching, the professional development of teachers should be given priority and the teachers must be trained so that they can handle the smart tools like uh, laptop, the Android phone, etc. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Kalita. Uh, sorry about the time. Uh, and this concludes our presentation today. But I wish we could have more time and we ran off it. So I apologize to those whom would ha I'd have to remind again and again. But having said this, I would like to thank you all for completing the presentation. And Dr. Das, is there anyone left? Yeah, yeah, madam, yeah. Yeah, now there is a uh, short piece from the chair. Hello, Silu, madam. Yes, sir. Yeah, you can start your speech, short okay. speech, yeah. yeah. All right. Congratulations and thank you, amazing presenters. What a synergy. I'm totally overwhelmed by the variety, depth, significance of all the wonderful papers, embracing the fact that impact of COVID has become a new normal in education system. I wish I could have listened lo longer. The synergy of this session reminded me of a world crisis. I have read somewhere that crisis also means an opportunity. So all the themes of your papers suggested transforming this COVID crisis into a meaningful opportunity to view education system through a new paradigm. Present context of pandemic also made me think of the plasticity, plasticity of human mind. And I can see the same element of grace, agility, hope and determination in your papers as transmitter of knowledge. As Dr. Gautam rightfully chose the title, whether COVID-19 is a curse or a blessing in disguise in education, the element of positivity and productivity is reflected in Dr. Barney's paper, Reshaping the Education World. Dr. Moyuri, uh, through her insightful remark on the impact of COVID, Dr. Ranju proposing the possibility through her comprehension Dr. Banasri Devi focusing on Indian education system, which resonates to other system as well. And Dr. Prapti Bas extended the possibility of neighborhood teaching to so truly remarkable. Likewise, online education has become a new normal for us. Yes. Dr. Parabi, he has wonderful presentation. I cannot get over stars without darkness. That was amazing. Dr. Dipali, both through the insightful presentation highlighted the challenge and the positivity utilizing the process, which is equally experienced in both teaching as well as learning. Dr. George, you like on the issues of teaching learning description, whereas Dr. Bonas and Dr. Chubo, Chuba, if you run some problems in education, they are genuine concerns. COVID has impacted social emotional, educational, along with behavioral aspect, which is reflected in Dr. Ajanta's paper, wonderfully written. And last but not least, Dr. Banas Shibadwas and Dr. Nikol Kumar wonderfully convert the role of literature and folklore through the lens of social media. Overall, these papers are unique, yet share common elements of purpose, possibility, perseverance, and positivity. And by this, your effort as people in academia makes you a warrior scholar to fight this pandemic together. I applaud your time, dedication, and willingness of choosing this profession where we can together make a difference through the power of education. Thank you for this enriching session. And with this, I would like to conclude my uh, small uh, speech today. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much for your kind support and help us. Okay, now as per schedule, we are going to start the invited speech.
first of all, I would like to invite the uh, fourth speaker. That means uh, yesterday, three speakers already done, we have. Then today, we have started the fourth speaker. That means today's first speaker, uh, Professor Edwin V. Tislingzen. So first of all, I would like to introduce our today's invited speaker. First of all, I would like to introduce Professor Edwin V. Tislingzen, Barmouth University, UK. Uh, at the same time, we are going to welcome him in this platform, sir. Uh, today, sir will deliver a, a valuable speech on COVID-19 in pregnancy and childbirth, prevention, management, and unintended consequences. Next, I'd like to introduce our today's another invited speaker, Professor Ram Saron Patoksar, Tribhuvan University, Nepal, uh, sir will deliver a valuable speech on impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on family planning services. At the same time, we are going to welcome once again Patak sir in this platform. Next, I'd like to introduce another guest speaker from Sri Lanka, Professor Sirimol Averente, uh, Professor of Economics, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. And at the same time, we are also welcome, sir, in this platform. Uh, Professor Sirimol, sir, deliver a valuable speech on COVID-19 and global economic crisis. Next, uh, we'd like to introduce uh, another share persons in the academic sessions three, uh, Professor Taibo Rahman, sir, uh, Professor of Development Studies, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh. At the same time, we are also going to welcome him in this platform. So uh, the introductory uh, program is closed here. So I would like to invite Professor Edwin V. Tindilson, uh, Brahmart University, UK, to deliver his valuable speech. OK, sir, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm going to try to get the slides up. Okay. Can you see the slides? Yes, yeah, sir. It's okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm very honored. Um, and I'd like to thank especially uh, Professor Dr. Ram Sharan Patak, because I think the invitation came through him. We've worked together on a project in Nepal on capacity building in the past. Um, I'm speaking about pregnancy and childbirth, about the prevention, management, and unintended consequences. And I'm happy to share the slides afterwards. I'll start with a little overview uh, about the topic today. Uh, I'll start up at the top with a, uh, a web page that uh, we've written with a couple of uh, Nepali colleagues uh, online. So the link is there if you're interested on newborns and perinatal health uh, and resources around COVID. I want to say a little bit today about pregnancy and mental health, link between COVID and um, and pregnancy and the effect of lockdown on pregnant women. So I'll start with physiology. So we often forget that pregnancy is a change, it's a physiological change in women's bodies. Um, they're uh, more likely to be susceptible to uh, infectious because their body is less aggressive in attacking because it doesn't want to attack a genetically different baby because there's genetic material from the father and the mother growing. Um, so that is a potentially a higher risk for any kind of uh, infections. The second one in terms of the physiology is when the baby is growing, it's pushing on the internal organs, including, including the lungs. So women who have COVID-19, which is a, a respiratory disease, 
they'll have difficulty breathing. So pregnant women often have difficulty breathing towards the end of their pregnancy because the, the lungs are just squeezed by the baby. So we need to bear those physiological elements in mind. And then there's the mental health aspect of it. So pregnancy and childbirth is a, a period that women worry about what's going to happen, what's going to happen to potentially to the baby, to their physiological chance, changes, physical changes. We also know from the literature that there's a growth in gender-based violence, violence against women during pregnancy. So this is before COVID and before lockdown across the world women experience more violence during pregnancy than when they're not pregnant. So that's a, a, a problem that, and that is exacerbated, made worse by COVID. And there's a notion of potential loss of identity. So for many of us, identity is related to our work. Um, many pregnant women know that after the baby is born, they're going to give up work or they're going to work part-time. Um, they're going to be less um, um, involved in the outside world. So there are notions of identity and social changes. The relationship with your partner, your husband changes, because the partner is also becoming a father. Um, and there's notions of helplessness and isolation during childbirth. And all these are uh, issues that are uh, existing before COVID. So on COVID, um, so this is the World Health Organization uh, advice on the notion of evidence. There isn't much data, but there is no evidence that pregnant women are at a higher risk than the general population. Okay, pregnant women are young, they're healthy. If you're not healthy and you're in a very poor health, you can't get pregnant or you're less likely to get pregnant. So therefore we talk about relatively healthy women who become pregnant, they're younger, COVID is in in many uh, countries, very much a disease of the uh, middle aged and older people. Um, we also know that pregnant women are unlikely to pass the baby on during pregnancy or the delivery. And uh, there is no evidence that it gets passed on through um, breast milk or amniotic fluid. So this is advice that we as healthcare professionals need to give to women. But there is a notion that women with comorbidity women with high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes, have, have a greater risk of COVID. So the comorbidities have an effect on the pregnancy. So your pregnancy outcome is um, potentially worse if you're obese or you have high blood pressure. But if you then also have COVID, that is an extra risk factor. Okay, so we need to bear that in mind. So the general advice for pregnant women of the things to keep yourself safe is the same as to the general population. Again, from the World Health Organization, I'm not gonna read them out, all of this, but just to start with the first one, washing your hands frequently with alcohol-based um, hand rubs or soap and water. It's the same as to all of us. You know, It's the same preventative kind of measure, social distancing, don't touch your eyes, your nose and your mouth. So there's nothing particular to pregnant women in the first in <coughs> instance than the general advice to um, the general public, people like you and I. Then there are some conflicting issues about whether or not pregnant women are at risk. So on the left hand side in yellow, um, this is from the International um, Society of Infectious Disease and Obstetrics and Gynecology. They say every pregnant woman is considered high risk due to the altered immune responses that I talked about, uh, and that the disease of COVID might be worse because of their physiological changes. So at the same time, on the right-hand side, and this is advice from the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Royal College of Midwives in the UK, pregnant women are not necessarily more susceptible to COVID-19 than the general population. So both of those statements are true, okay? So pregnant women are at higher risk, when they're catching COVID, but they're not necessarily, on the right-hand side, more susceptible. They're not more likely to get COVID than um, a non-pregnant woman or a, a man of the same age. So I've highlighted some of the guidelines, and there's loads of different guidelines, so they're numbered. So this is guideline number 16. So during pregnancy, uh, during the pandemic, women need routine antenatal care. They need their, uh, their, their, their checkups. 
because the checkups look at things that might potentially go wrong in the pregnancy and they're very important as a preventative measure. So in terms of, we should keep social distancing, we should try to get consultations over the phone or by video or by Skype if possible, but women also need to come and see their obstetrician, their midwife, um, um, their, their nurse midwife, in order to check up on the, um, the growth of the, uh, the fetus. If this routine care is disrupted, so if women can go, and we've seen some examples of this in, in Nepal, I'm not familiar in India, but some of it will have happened that due to social distancing, some people cannot, um, cannot travel or are prevented to travel, um, there's no public transport, then women are less likely to come to health posts, to doctors, to hospitals for, for checkup, and therefore things go wrong in pregnancy and they go unnoticed. Okay, this is a paper in the Lancet. I put as much as possible the papers where I got the information from to show that it's evidence-based. Women should continue to take folic acid and vitamin D, a supplement, eat healthily, um, do exercise. And at the same time, we also know that people from ethnic minority backgrounds have a higher risk of developing COVID in the UK. And we know the same in the United States. So people are disadvantaged. Um, so it might be noted of disadvantage, but it might also be an element of um, stigma and discrimination, but there might also be an element of genetics. So I've already said, um, if women are uh, suspected to have or are confirmed COVID, they should still be supported to breastfeed because the benefits of breastfeeding, the, the bonding between the mother and the baby and the, 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 the positive effect of the nutrients in the breast milk uh, outweigh um, any of the potential risks. In terms of mental health, COVID adds another layer. I've already talked about some of the issues of mental health in pregnancy. It, because of COVID and because of social distancing and because of difficulties in traveling, it's di more difficult to access mental health care for pregnant women who need it. Social distancing could also mean social isolation, so women not being able to talk to uh, other women or to healthcare professionals in terms of advice. Women are less likely to go for antenatal care with the negative consequences that come with that. And we also find in the UK that obstetric wards, maternity hospitals um, are discharging women earlier. So they're not staying in hospital for that long to reduce the risk of getting COVID-19. But that also means there is less opportunity and less chance to give health education, give advice to new mothers on feeding the baby, washing the baby and, and so on. There's also notions on the staff advice uh, on, related to pregnancy. So uh, doctors, midwives uh, are advised to keep a social distance if at all possible. Not always possible if you need to palpitate uh, uh, the, the, the woman if you need to touch, but as much as possible use protective uh, equipment. Um, Encourage women to seek information only from reliable sources, from government sources, from the WHO. There's a lot of fake news about some of the early presenters talked about this, um, about um, social media and fake news. There's a lot of nonsense around uh, COVID-19 on the web. Um, we also need to involve women in the decision making around um, uh, pregnancy, about childbirth, uh, give them back control and empowerment. Um, and we need to advise women to think about anxiety management, about yoga, about meditation to, in order to relax, to make that childbirth easier, um, but also to make their health, their overall mental health better. So it is important to have psychosocial support uh, from competent midwives uh, or nurse midwives, auxiliary nurse midwives uh, and their family in order to reduce the stress levels and help women to cope with the challenges of childbirth. The WHO, the World Health Organization, recommends interpartum care, so that's during the delivery, uh, to make this a positive experience, to make sure that the, the actual delivery um, helps um, women to gain control, to um, have women-centered outcome, and not just uh, work on this as routine clinical practices. It is about making 
childbirth a positive experience, which is very important for mental health. Um, and then after the birth, new, afterwards, pregnant women, or sorry, women who are new mothers, need advice on uh, vaccinations and guidance on postnatal physical health, on the well-being of the baby, and how to care for the newborn baby. So we need to think about giving that kind of advice, and that kind of advice could easily be um, uh, done over the phone or by Skype or by video. So think about using um, uh, internet resources, if at all possible, to keep social distancing. And in terms of uh, the, the wider picture, in terms of research, we need to think about it in, in everywhere, but because I'm talking in India, India need to think about mental health interventions and programs for pregnant women and new mothers. We need to reduce interventions, especially cesarean sections in um, cities, in private hospitals, and wealthy urban women who really don't need cesarean sections. We need to train more midwives, midwives as specialists in, in normal care in pregnancy and childbirth, and we need to um, increase health promotion uh, during maternity care. And then this is my last slide. Um, I'm, uh, one of the co-editors for the Journal of Asian Midwives, and this came out uh, this week, uh, editorial on new coronavirus. And the thing that I've highlighted in the box is that we need to remember that whatever happens in terms of disasters, you know, be that an earthquake in Nepal or India or a drought or flooding in Assam, you still get women delivering babies the next day. So we, we, when we think about COVID, there's lots of things to think about COVID in terms of as a disease, but normal life goes on and therefore pregnant women will have babies, but women fall, will fall pregnant and therefore need continu continuous um, um, good quality maternity care. Uh, I'm an academic, so I put the references on and I put my Twitter address. So thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much, sir, for your valuable speech. Uh, next, I would like to invite to deliver the speech uh, Professor Ramsaran Patok, Tribhuvan University, Nepal. Patok, sir. Hello. Patok, sir. Hello. Patok, sir. Hello, Patak sir. Hello. Yeah, sir. Yes, yes. Oh, uh, yeah, right, sir. Now? Yes, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Please, sir, go ahead. Okay, okay. Aha. Uh -huh. Ow. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Dinesh, uh, for this uh, opportunity to deliver my speech uh, on the uh, impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on, on family planning, on family planning services. Uh, thank you. I think I should like to, I should uh, share my uh, presentation here now. Okay, just, just a second. Okay. 
Uh, can you see uh, my slide here now? Yes, yeah, sir. It's visible. Okay. Okay. Impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on pampering service. So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Dinesh, uh, the chair of the organizing committee, and all the colleagues of that uh, uh, college, uh, Gusegao University, uh, for providing us this opportunity uh, as a chair and the speaker of this uh, important international conference on COVID-19, impact of COVID-19, the global challenges. And also I am very uh, pleased today that I have seen now my friend, uh, 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 Professor Edwin uh, from Burnmouth University. Uh, we, are, we actually have uh, worked together for long uh, in different projects uh, uh, in partnership, higher education, something like that, uh, of the British Council funded project. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. Uh, uh, Edwin, are you there now? Edwin? Professor Edwin? Yes, sorry, I, I'm here. Sorry, I was, I was oh, muted. Okay, 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 okay. Namaste, namaste. Okay, so also the, I would actually like to uh, deal with this uh, family planning services, the impact. Yesterday, when I was sharing the session, uh, all uh, the presenters actually, they were uh, focused on the tourism sector, the economics, tourism sector. Uh, but I am now worried about the uh, health uh, side, especially the sexual and reproductive health, uh, uh, basically the family planning, which is the key component of the sexual and uh, reproductive health. The others being uh, like actually the adolescence and sexual reproductive health, right? Then infertility. Uh, uh, then uh, RTIs, STIs, HIV AIDS, new natural care, uh, uh, safe abortion, maternal care, care of elderly, and gender-based violence. Actually, in Nepal, uh, the government has recognized uh, the nine major components of sexual and rural health, and in which family planning is the key component. So I'm family planning. Uh, actually, I would like to focus on family planning, mainly on family planning. It's no doubt that it will have its impacts on other uh, components as well. But basically, I would like to focus on family planning. There are many reasons why I focus on family planning. So there are benefits, a lot of benefits uh, by focusing on family planning. As you all know, family planning shapes lives, shapes women's lives, children's lives, adolescents' lives. It impacts women and so many things. That's why I would like to focus on the family planning. Before actually uh, going to the uh, impact uh, as such, uh, uh, I would like to actually uh, draw your attention on the, on the global uh, family planning status as such. Global family planning status as such, uh, as we know that uh, there are 214 million women of reproductive age in developing countries who want to avoid pregnancy are not using a modern contraceptive methods. So there is obviously the case of unmet need, unmet need, avoid pregnancy, but are not using modern contraceptive methods. 214 million women. So this is the first case in the status globally. And secondly, uh, there's question of unmet need. Unmet need for contraception remains highest among the most vulnerable in society. Who are vulnerable then? For example, adolescents are vulnerable, poor people are vulnerable, living in the, those people living in the rural areas, they are vulnerable, urban slums, people living with the SIB and internally displaced people, all they are vulnerable, right? So unmet need actually, if you look at the data, are quite high uh, among the most vulnerable in society. Uh, this is the situation we have now. Uh, then, uh, what is the status of contraceptive prevalence rate? Many of us, uh, I think many of you or us, we know CPR is contraceptive prevalence rate. Uh, women aged uh, 15 to 49, the, it is the, uh, it, this gives an idea about the modern method. So if you look at this figure, what we see is that the uh, more developed regions, they have the higher CPR compared to the less developed regions like us, like Nepal, India, and so on. So we can, it's obvious that uh, the uh, uh, CPR is lower in more developed region and compared to ours and is still lower in least developed regions. This is the case we have. So this is the data we got, we get from the state of old population, very 
most recent uh, uh, report, State of Old Population 2019. Uh, then again, the status, family planning indicators, because I'm, I would like to focus on family planning. So uh, I would like to uh, actually uh, uh, share with you the status as such by regions. By regions, you can see Arab estimates, Asia, the Pacific, Eastern Europe and Central Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean, Eastern, East and Southern Africa, uh, West and Central Africa. If you look at the data, what we find is that uh, the modern contraceptive premiums rate, EMCPR, is uh, highest uh, in the Latin America and the Caribbean, right? Uh, it's quite, uh, it's lowest in the West and Central Africa. Uh, in the Asia and Pacific, it is 62. Yeah, look at the unmet need also. Unmet need is lowest in the Latin America and the uh, uh, Caribbean, right? And in Central Asia, uh, higher in Africa, right? So this is the situation we have here. And also we have not been able to satisfy uh, the demand the, of the family planning, the total, uh, as you know, net need, unmet need equals the total need. So, so we have not been able to actually meet all the demand. So the, you look at the last uh, uh, column, uh, this is the proportion of demand satisfied with method, you know. So uh, even in uh, just in, uh, look at the Central Africa, just 39% of the modern methods demand is satisfied, right? It's somewhere else is highest in here in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, Asia 81 and so on. So this, is, this gives an idea at least uh, the status of the family planning indicators, time met need, unmet need, total need and proportion of demand satisfied as such. Uh, this also data sources state of old population, the latest report, uh, UNFPA, 2019. Uh, then, okay, what is the regional status then? A national family planning status, I would like to give example from Nepal because many of the attendees, participants, I can see that most are from India. So they know much more uh, than me uh, than, uh, than, than me about India. So I would like to give some example from Nepal. Uh, but first of all, in Asia, I said 10.2 percent of women of river age has unmet need for family plan services. Uh, this is from WSO 2018. In Nepal, 24 uh, uh, percent of currently married women, that is nearly 1.5 million, have an unmet need for family plan services in Nepal. 24 percent. I don't know about India. I didn't check uh, for India. You all know about India. I think it should be somewhere 30, 35. I don't know, or uh, even 25. Uh, and, and then unmet need uh, varies by 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 wealth quintile, you know, uh, wealth quintile. For example, uh, from 27 percent among women in the lowest wealth quintile to 21 percent among those in the highest quintile. So uh, it is highest in the, uh, the in the in the it is actually the unmet need varies uh, definitely by wealth quintile. 27 percent among women lowest wealth quintile. So uh, the highest in the sorry lowest in the highest women lowest uh, uh, in the wealth quintile and 20 percent among those in the highest quintile. Uh, as I just uh, mentioned you already uh, that uh, there is a need for investing in family planning because we have a lot of benefits from family planning. Uh, so there is a need for investment. Uh, so uh, I have here uh, uh, data from. Uh, this uh, that uh, low, lower middle income groups they have 31 uh, percent unmet need, low income 51 percent, and upper middle income 14 percent. So I think we are somewhere here in lower middle income. Nepal, India, uh, we are here somewhere in lower middle income. So we have uh, 31 percent of unmet need. Uh, so there's a need for investing in unmet need. Uh, sorry, family planning. Uh, there are many reasons why uh, unmet need uh, exists. Uh, 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 there are many reasons, right? For example, there are limited choices, limited access, fear of experience side effects, cultural or religious opposition, poor quality of available services, users and provider bias, gender bias, so and so forth. So now the COVID-19 is a problem now. So in addition to these existing problems, now we have COVID-19. So it is also it's, uh, uh, a problem now and uh, uh, is accelerating the, the, the level of unmet need because of COVID-19. Uh, so here, uh, 
as, as you all know that the sustainable development goals, sustainable development goals, uh, we have uh, 17 goals and 169 targets, right? So it is uh, emphasized that we have to now begin from voluntary family planning, invest in family planning. Uh, if there is universal access of sexual and reproductive health, including family planning, or we, which, is the, which is the key component of sexual and reproductive health, universal access, we will have huge return of investment. So this is the logic, why we should invest in family planning. So it is here, the best buy for development. Every dollar, one US dollar spent is estimated to return dollar 120 US dollar if the old achieves universal access to SRF, sexual and reproductive health. So if you spend, if you invest little, you will get more. So that is the best buy for development. So this is the learning. That is what, uh, uh, how uh, the family planning advocates argue. So, so this is the best uh, uh, in uh, develop, this is the best buy, family plan the best buy for development. Look at the SDG, as you are familiar with the SDG commitments, uh, our government uh, commitments uh, and national family planning program. For example, this is the uh, data from Nepal, you know. CPR in our case is 43% as for the DHS, Demographic Health Survey 2016. Now our aim is to target is 75% for 2030. And then uh, proportional women are a reported age who have their need for family planning satisfied with modern measures is 56% now. We want to uh, increase it to 80%. Uh, the LHCC birth rate, birth rate uh, is 88 now. So we want to bring it down to 30. Unmet need for family plan 24% right now. We want to bring it down to 10% by 2030. A total fertility rate, it is 2.3 now. We want to bring it down to 2.1, what we call the replacement level of fertility. We want to buy by 2030. This is our actually commitments of the government of Nepal, but we don't know whether we can <laughs> We will be able to achieve these uh, SDG targets, uh, commitments, uh, because of the COVID-19. So COVID-19 is a problem now. Uh, I think you, uh, we are also familiar with the Nairobi Summit on, in, on uh, International Conference on Population and Development, uh, ICPD 25, which was held in uh, on, uh, Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, during 12 to 14 November 2019, this latest summit and this has its own statement, which actually emphasizes for zero unbid need for family planning. For example, Nairobi statement calls for achieving three zeros, zero maternal deaths, zero unbid need for family planning, zero gender-based violence, and harmful practices against women and girls by 2030. The deadline for achieving the SD, so zero unbid need. So how can we achieve the zero unbid need? This is problem now. Because of the COVID-19, uh, because of, however, COVID-19 pandemic could critically undermine the progress made towards achieving these goals. So this is problem now. Uh, also, I think uh, we should be familiar with the uh, uh, theme, Population Day theme, World Population Day, which we uh, uh, celebrated on 11 July 2020. The theme is putting the brakes on COVID-19. How to safeguard the health and rights of women and girls now? This is the theme of the old publishing day, uh, the 11 July, right, 2030. So based on this, there are some key points here. The COVID-19 crisis has shocked people. It has shocked us, communities and economies everywhere. And, but the, the case is, uh, no, but not everyone is affected equally, we all know. So supply chains around the world are being disrupt, uh, disrupted impacting the availability of contraceptives and heightening the risk of unintended pregnancy. Again, the theme, COVID-19 in every country is critical and will determine how fast the world recovers and whether we achieve the sustainable goals or not. That's the case. So this question now of, of the sustainable development goals. And on July 11, uh, on 11 July, Old Population Day, UNFPA officials are encouraged to raise awareness about the family planning and sexual and reproductive health needs and explore how to maintain the momentum towards achieving the SDGs by 2030. That was advocated, that was rallied at the Nairobi summit. So now the context is uh, a family planning context and COVID-19, something like that. 
as we all know, the novel COVID-19 has spread rapidly since emerging in late 2019, uh, leading the WHO to declare the disease a global pandemic on March 11, 2020. Governments around the world have had to quickly adapt and respond to cop transmission of the virus and to provide care for the many who have been infected. The strain, the pressure that the outbreak imposes on us, on our health system, will undoubtedly impact the family planning and sexual and reproductive health of individuals, especially in lower middle income countries like Nepal and India. Family planning and sexual and reproductive health will also be affected by societal responses to the pandemic, such as uh, we are having now local uh, lockdowns, national lockdown as such. So it will also affect uh, the responses. COVID-19 pandemic is already having an adverse effects on the supply chain for contraceptive commodities by dis disrupting the manufacture of key pharmaceutical components of contraceptive measures or manufacture of the measures themselves, for example, condoms, delaying transportation of contraceptive commodities. So that's the case. The secondly, equipment and staff involved in family planning and sexual and liberal services may be diverted to fulfill other needs. Clinics may core, close, and people may be reluctant to go to the health facilities for family planning and sexual and rural services. And many governments are restricting people's movements, like we're having in Nepal and India, to stop the spread of the virus, right? Many are restricting. And providers are being forced to suspend some family planning, sexual and rural services, like, for example, abortion care. This is the case that we are having in Nepal, should be case in the uh, India as well. The country lockdowns in Nepal and India, the country lockdowns in Nepal and India have forced clinics operated by uh, Mary Stops International. I, I, I got this information somewhere. The largest provider of family services in Nepal and India outside of the public sector, Mary Stops International to close. I don't know whether it's open in uh, India or not, but, uh, but still problem in our, in our country. Uh, without concerned action, access to essential family planning and sexual and reproductive services and the quality of any care that is provided will likely to decline. The COVID-19 pandemic has raised the health systems, has tested the health system of all the countries. COVID-19 has tested the health system of all the countries and some of the supposedly strong health system in European and North American nations, even they have bowed down under the pressure. So what to talk about our weak health system of like Nepal and India, even the strong health system of the European North American countries, they have put down because of the COVID-19. There's no way. The so secondly, the focus is now on uh, countries, uh, lower middle income countries, such as Nepal and India, to see how they are handling the pandemic. Their health systems are considered weaker and the additional load of pandemic management makes it impossible to ensure the routine services, the regular services, family planning, social and liberal services. Strained health systems worldwide are pivoting resources to treat COVID-19 patients. And women are finding it more difficult to receive the family planning information and services they need. Low income families are especially at risk since they rely on government health centers and midwives to access free, free contraceptives. So low, the problem in low income families. Uh, impact, there is a global consensus on the importance of making voluntary family planning available to all women. Not only the access to family planning is a human right. We have to look at the family planning from the human rights perspective as well. But it saves lives and promotes health care population that I just mentioned in the beginning. So much progress has been made in the last 25 years to make family planning methods available with the number of women using modern contraceptive methods almost doubling from 470, 470 million in 1990 to 840 million in 2018. As of March 2020, there were an estimated 450 million women using modern contraceptive across 114 priority lower middle income countries. The COVID-19 pandemic, as well as social distancing, 
as other strategies to reduce transmission are anticipated to impact the ability of women to continue using contraception. Disruptions to global manufacturing and supply chains may also reduce the availability of contraceptive com commodities. The closure of health facilities, unavailability of medical staff to provide family and services and women themselves being hesitant to visit health facilities due to concerns about COVID-19 exposure are additionally anticipated to impact women's access to and continued use of contraception. This is also impact of COVID-19. UNFPA, as you are familiar with UNFPA, UN, UNFPA estimated the impact of different lengths of disruptions, for example, three months disruptions, uh, three months lockdown, six months lockdown, nine months, 12 months. So dif different levels of disruptions, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months, estimated the impact with different levels of service disruptions. Without mitigation strategies, depending on the degree that health services are disrupted, and the duration of these disruptions is estimated that between 13 million and 51 million women who otherwise would have used modern contraceptives will be unable to use it. See, so serious case if, by, because of the disruptions, various levels of disruptions. The reduction in contraceptive use would have dire consequences for women from 325,000 unintended pregnancies, the estimate for minimal disruption for three months up to a shocking 15 million on experience if high distortions are seen for a period of 12 months, uh, 12 months. This is clear in this table. I have this table from the UNFPA uh, report, uh, like various levels of disruption. For example, low health service disruption, medium health service disruption, high health service disruption. Here we have an estimated number of women not able to use modern contraceptives, estimated number of unintended pregnancies. This is all about estimated number of women not able to use modern contraceptives and incident number of unintended pregnancies. So I, have, I, just look, I just would like to look at high health service disruptions. If there is three month lockdown, see 44 million estimated number of women not able to use modern contraceptives. One million estimated number of unintended pregnancies. If you look at 12 month dis lockdown, 51 million. So there is from 44 million to 51 million if there is a disruption of three months to 12 months disruption. High, high, high health service disruption. Then again, unintended, unintended pregnancies here uh, from uh, 1 million to 50 million, right? If there is a high health service disruption from three months, 12 months uh, lockdown. So this is the case we have here from the data. The, this is evident in, the, in this table. So what can be done? There are some key action points. Social distancing, okay. And limitations on mobility speaks to an urgent need to expand postpartum family planning services. Postpartum family planning services, particularly long acting uh, methods, long acting uh, contraceptive methods, right? Just for example, uh, uh, implants, uh, postpartum uh, IUDs or injectables. So these are very important. Uh, self care family planning methods should be promoted and supplied to men and men proactively, self-care family members could be, for example, the emergency contraceptions, implant, as such, something like that. Barriers for accessing contraception need to be lifted. Another point. Then telemedicine, implement telemedicine using mobile phones and social media. That is also key action. Address likely supply chain needs and challenges. We have to do this. Then health care workers must be provided uh, adequate uh, PPE, personal protective equipment. That is very must. So COVID-19 family planning in Nepal, uh, as of 30 July today, uh, globally affected uh, almost 17.2 million, I would say, right? 17.2 uh, million days, 670,152. Uh, Nepal case 19, as of today, 19,273 days, 49 we have. In India, in India affected how much? Uh, 1.5, 1, 1.5, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, okay, uh, 1.5 million and days, 35,000, something like that, right? So, so many, uh, so many uh, uh, cases here we have days. So compared to Nepal, it is quite high in India. 
So actually, uh, the, uh, this pandemic has impacted almost all the countries, not only Nepal and India, and all countries. So, but I have here data for in Nepal and India only. So it is impacting almost all the dimensions, including health, economic, social, cultural, individuals, and so on, what not. So it is impacting almost all the dimensions. So the choices and rights to sexual and liberal care, however, should be respected, regardless of COVID-19, so whatever the COVID-19 status, but choices and rights, sexual and liberal health, that should be taken care of. The impact of the health system due to COVID-19 ranges from the disturbances in service delivery, shifting priorities of health financing, shortage of medicines, medications due to distortions in supply chains. Uh, in case of family planning, actually, family planning is quite badly affected by COVID-19. Affected by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for example, the mobilization of clinical staff with COVID-19 response because of it, lack of PPE by the health workers, limited service in public health facilities due to lockdown or fear of COVID-19 exposure among health workers and the people. Disturbances in the supply chain management system from production to reaching to the last mile, that is the needy people. Uh, again, the problems, commodity shortages and lack of trained family planning service providers result in limited choices of family planning method, no choices at all. Long acting, especially the long acting, acting reversible contraceptives. The might, this might result in increased use of less effective methods. That's a problem. Including traditional method might go up or it might, it, or methods use uh, may lead to discontinuation. In Nepal, the scarcity data so that the service utilization of family planning is low as compared to past. The number of new users of family planning is declining across countries. So what are the initiatives taken uh, in Nepal? Actually, uh, I would like to give an example from Nepal. Initiatives taken to respond to SRSR, sexual and reproductive health rights during COVID-19. Government of Nepal, Ministry of Health and Population has developed the health sector response plan for COVID-19 response, at least. The Ministry of Health and Population communicated with all the provinces and lower level governments for the continuation of essential health care services, including sexual and reproductive health and rights services. We have also guideline. The guideline is interim guideline on reproductive newborn child and adolescent health uh, services. We have guideline um, um, uh, framed by the uh, government, uh, we are also the guideline. But the question is of implementation. Uh, it is here with take again. Routine service continuation has been closely monitored during crisis in partnership with local and provincial governments, relevant partners. Health facilities have been open even during the lockdown. It is said uh, in the, in the, in the uh, uh, booklet also. There is a system for monitoring of the stock situation of key commodities and supplies on family planning and reproductive newborn child health, uh, child, child and adolescent health services. Uh, at federal level, the health cluster, RA subcluster, nutrition cluster are actively engaged to plan, implement, and monitoring of the services. At province level, there are health and nutrition clusters activated in all the provinces, uh, with, while RS groups are being formed based on the needs. Minister of Health and Population and its partners had supplied a PPE and other supplies for the continuation of family planning and reproductive uh, newborn child health and services. One of the challenges of the COVID-19 in uh, reproductive newborn child health uh, services, child and adolescent health services is in upcoming days will come due to the influx of returning migrants. Returning migrants, especially from India. Now, key message. So we, anyway, we have to be prepared now. Always prepared, COVID-19. Uh, because of COVID-19, we don't know how long the COVID-19 go, right? So uh, we have to always be prepared. So what is the key message then? During public health emergencies, human and financial resources are often diverted from various health programs to respond to the infectious disease outbreak. Sexual and family planning services are being impacted by the pandemic and must be prioritized. The COVID-19 pandemic will further strain health systems and is expected to severely impact the health systems of lower and middle income countries like Nepal and India. So short term now, intervention. So we should have intervention short term. What could be short term intervention? 
ensure women's and girls' rights and rights to sexual and reproductive health as respected, regardless of their COVID-19 status, including access to contraception, emergency contraception, safe abortion to the full extent of the law and post absent care. Uh, then secondly, in the short term intervention, work with the Ministry of Health and Population and relevant line ministries and provide sector and the private sector to ensure availability and access to essential sexual and reproductive health and rights. This should include the implementation of the MISP. Minimum, MISP means minimum initial service package as recommended by the UNFP during the emergencies during the humanitarian crisis like, uh, like, like this COVID uh, pandemic. So minimum initial service package. Support supply chain. Long-term strengthen, always I have to be careful about the long-term. So strengthen health systems to ensure continuity of sexual and liberal services that integrate gender-based violence services during public health emergencies. Actually, last two slides are their sort of conclusion as I uh, actually uh, 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 mentioned in the beginning, that it's a core component of the reproductive health family planning, core component of sexual and reproductive health. And uh, it's, 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 it's true that access to family planning services is a fundamental human right. So based on this standard, standard means it is a core component of sexual and reproductive health, and it is a human right, fundamental human right. So based on this standard, this standard needs to be respected and protected as such by governments, prioritizing scarce resources during this pandemic. Secondly, but with the focus of many health systems on the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the provision of basic contraception counseling, the delivery of contraceptive products and services, and the functioning of supply chains have been disrupted. And women and men are at disadvantage in seeking care from their regular providers. Uh, UN Secretary General has issued a call for continued delivery of sexual and liberal services, such as access to contraception without prescription, even without prescription during the crisis. Uh, key global partners and governance bodies have strongly voiced this, so continued delivery of services. So some of the expected impacts of the COVID-19 include, as we all know, three delays. Delays in seeking care, accessing care, receiving care. So three delays, very important. So because of COVID-19, we have a problem uh, in this, uh, yeah, in this uh, uh, three delays. These issues make it all the more important to prioritize the provision of contraception, not only in the midst of COVID-19, but at all times. So based on this, actually, I would like to uh, say uh, finally that family planning is the best buy for development. It saves lives. So we have, we have based on family planning, we should take care of family planning. So thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Patok sir. Thank you for your valuable speech. Now we are going to next speaker. So I would like to invite Professor Srimal Abrente. Professor of Economics, University of Colombo, Sri Lanka. Please, sir, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dinesh. Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, this is a privilege and honor to me to speak to a, such a distinguished uh, set of participants. Uh, I hope uh, my timing is about 20 minutes if uh, Dr. Dinesh has not cut down it yet. Uh, yeah. I hope uh, to finish uh, before 20 minutes. And although my topic is a, a big one and quite a different one, global economic crisis. Let me first uh, elaborate my conclusions that I'm going to uh, draw at the end of the presentation. First, even without the COVID-19 pandemic issue, the world had been heading towards a crisis. This is not a new thing that I'm saying. Uh, 
I have been uh, giving uh, some lectures and some presentations even before the COVID issue on the same uh, problem. Secondly, I oh, oh, yeah. uh, like to mention, uh, I like to mention that uh, we didn't feel the global financial crisis, particularly those who are living in Asia, uh, which happened about 10, 12 years ago uh, for a particular reason. But uh, this crisis, we all are going to feel both uh, advanced countries and developing countries alike. The second conclusion and the third conclusion, and as we see now, everybody's, uh, every government is taking measures, particularly those uh, fiscal and monetary policy stimuli to deal with the crisis. But in Asia, particularly in South Asia, uh, by looking at the past performance, we need to go beyond that because recovery would not be sufficient and uh, we need to think of beyond recovery. So those will be my conclusions and let me begin with that the recession, we were heading towards a recession, the global economy, even without the uh, COVID issue. Why do we say that? Because there has been a massive growth of money and debt in the world. Uh, if you examine the money growth and debt growth simultaneously in most of the advanced countries, European Union, uh, the USA, the Japan, and uh, even China, in all these countries, the massive amount of money issued during this uh, 10, 12 year period uh, has led to uh, negative interest rates in some regions. The reason has been the world had the fear of deflation. The world had the fear of deflation and in fact, the world did not recover from the global financial crisis uh, as the way that we expected it to recover, so that the countries also needed to avoid, avoid uh, lower growth. So there has been uh, one important policy measure that we have seen, particularly in advanced countries, that is printing more and more money. And also the world is uh, getting flooded with piling up, debt filing up. Uh, debt is actually uh, the cause for a crisis also. Now, if you look at the global financial crisis, the immediate causes of the crisis, you would see many, you can list out actually many explanations, uh, the causes that they have explained. I'm not uh, denying them, many of them. Uh, we can categorize actually all these causes under three, four headings. Some of the causes attribute to the failure of the government or the failure of the policy. If you look at the immediate causes of the global financial crisis, some of the causes were attributed to the market failures. It's a failure of the market so that we shouldn't allow the market to perform as the way that it has performed there. And some of the explanations were also uh, related to the speculative attacks. Uh, speculative attacks, they were the cause of the global financial crisis. But if you take a deeper look at, you would see uh, the debt, public debt, of the United States as a percentage of their GDP is becoming, a, it's showing a spike. In fact, you would see that spike even before Great Depression as well. And that spike tells us something. What if that before the crisis, there are going to be a debt GDP ratio, the ratio of debt to GDP, the spike of that ratio 
before the crisis and that you would examine that you would see uh, this spike even after the crisis and it is actually uh, becoming going bad to worse in fact it was because of the some of the policies that were adopted by these countries to as response to the global financial crisis as i said deflation and low growth the world needs to avoid these things so that the monetary expansion was one of the key policies that have been taken place uh, now we learn in our macroeconomic books that uh, the money growth excessive money growth is leading to inflation but uh, during the last 10 years so we don't see inflation there has been massive increase in money but you haven't seen it, uh, the world is uh, uh, building up inflation repression so that uh, i wonder that whether we should uh, tear off those uh, macroeconomic textbook pages which explain the relationship between money and inflation there's a reason also for that but this is not the time to explain it uh, so there was no inflation during this time uh, however the world as a result of these things you would also examine if you look at the many uh, areas uh, that you would examine that you, that would tell you the different kinds of indicators of global crisis you would see some of the important things in the, apart from debt piling up you would see the deterioration of the debt quality deterioration of the debt quality in fact you would also see the uh, shifting uh, shifting speculative investment from stock markets from bond markets to gold markets and so on you would see many uh, indicators as such as the uh, as those that you would examine that you would observe at the doorstep of uh, global crisis so here we are uh, having a global crisis led by the covid pandemic issue so what i explain now even without this we would have been there now it tells us that the covid pandemic issue came up and we were hit by this issue in the worst time of the global history at a time that our economic strength has been exhausted uh, when we attempt to deal with the previous crisis and then we were heading towards another crisis and then here comes the covid pandemic issue uh, giving a hard hit to the world economy and what do we mean by economic crisis economic crisis means actually the contraction in the volume of economic activities in the world if you look at the ultimate result of that ultimate result of that you would see people losing their livelihoods and jobs and incomes and then the world is becoming poorer than it used to be earlier uh, now this is where we are now if we why we have to feel this living in asia why we have to feel it why we didn't feel the previous crisis much if you examine the growth rates uh, during 2008 and 2009 you would see that the world uh, output has contracted so much and the contraction has been in rich countries not in developing countries the growth rates of the developing countries fell down but they did not turn into negative rates that tells us something different because what we have learned earlier when we learned development economics we had to learn that when there is a problem in rich countries it is the developing countries which have to suffer more but this time it was not so as you would see and there are many other symptoms that i would like to show you and the debt problem has become a problem of advanced countries more than the problem of developing countries why because 
there has been a global shifting production process from advanced countries to developing countries and for that matter particularly to developing asia over the last few decades and that's one reason why we didn't feel the global financial crisis as well because there has been a capital outflow from advanced countries in fact if you examine last few decades two three decades capital outflows or foreign direct investment outflows you would you would see exponential growth of capital outflows particularly from rich countries towards developing countries number one as far as the fdi inflows are concerned number two earlier it was a business uh, among rich countries so the capital started flowing out from rich countries and they enter into rich countries but the developing countries received uh, probably about uh, before 1980s 1990s the developing countries received about 20 25% of the global capital but now it has exceeded half it has an exponential growth and exceed, exceeded half in fact that has made the that has made the global financial crisis even fast so my point is that's the reason why the developing countries did not experience the previous crisis as the way it happened in the world but this time it is different because the covid pandemic issue has made it truly global because of that developing countries also have to suffer now let's look at the uh, finally uh, what are the policies policy options available for this and as i said before the advanced countries have been pumping more money because they were dependent more on uh, they were dependent more on uh, fiscal stimulus uh, because they have already come to the Uh, come to the boundaries limitations of their monetary policies you know, come in bringing their interest rates to zero level and in some countries even below zero level so they don't have that much space monetary space to push uh, forward their monetary policy agenda so they depend that more on the fiscal policy stimulus but in developing countries here in asia south asia we are dependent more on monetary policy stimulus because our space is still available for monetary policy stimulus but not for the fiscal policy stimulus because narrow fiscal space has been one of our uh, deep rooted uh, economic policy issue but this is this both these policies which were the one you consider monetary policy stimulus so fiscal policy stimulus that helps people and businesses to keep their nose above the water it does not help more than the recovery in fact uh, before this issue came up you must have noticed that the fastest growing region in the world has also been south asia it was east asia before but from east asia it has shifted to south asia so that south asia has been growing faster than east asia as well and attracting more capital more and more growing capital inflows but there is a problem in these countries the problem is their domestic demand had more space than their international demand or export growth that has been the problem so that the sustainability of that growth created an issue now here we are face with the crisis and there is a sustainability issue of our growth oriented policy so that's why i say that it is quite important for the developing countries in asia to look beyond the policy stimulus in order to uh, in order to in order to remove the structural issues and go for the go for the uh, deliberately pushing the economies towards the international markets for export growth you would also see something uh, some policy options coming up 
from the opposite side. They think that this is the time for uh, this is the time for domestic economic activities and agriculture economic activities, and so against globalization and all these uh, protectionist ideas also coming up. Not only in developing countries, even in advanced countries, they have been in fact following certain important policies along these lines also. But there is something that we need to understand, both protectionist, uh, liberals, uh, neoliberals, neoclassicals, all of them, Keynesians, they all understand one important point that we cannot dispute. The progress is limited by the size of the market. In fact, the economists know it for the last 250 years. The progress is not limited. The progress is limited by the size of the market. So if you know the underlying, uh, underlying theory, underlying policies uh, of this uh, dictum, in fact, it is time uh, that we need to push towards the, our export growth. Of course, the, my last point, we will also have opportunities coming up, opportunities coming up, opportunities emerging from difficulties. So there are opportunities various opportunities emerging from difficulties for the policymakers to focus on. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Dr. Das. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir, for your valuable speech. <laughs> sir, hello. Uh, yes, yeah, I can sir. hear you, Dr. Das. Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your valuable speech. Uh, yeah. Now, here we uh, finish the guest speakers uh, program. Now we are going to start the academic sessions uh, three. Uh, these sessions actually um, uh, shared uh, by the Professor Taibur Roman, University of Dhaka, Bangladesh, but due to his some problems uh, pre-scheduled uh, at the meeting 2.30 and times in Bangladesh. Uh, he, he will not be available in the platform. So uh, I would like to request uh, uh, another invited guest, Professor Ramsaran Patho, uh, Trihuvan University, Nepal, to take this share and hope, I will hope that shares uh, did uh, that uh, academic sessions will be shared by Ramsar Patok sir and run by fruitfully. Please, sir, Ramsar Patok sir. Hello. Hello. Hello, Patok sir. Hello. Uh, Dr. Dinesh. Yeah, yeah, sir. Yeah. I am here. Yeah, yeah, sir. Now, I, okay. I would like to request you to share this session. Uh -huh. Yeah, last, last session. Yeah, 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 yeah. Session number three. Okay. Academic session three. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I'll, I'll look at it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so, sir, please uh -huh. go ahead, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, already, uh, I have, I have, already, I have sent a presenter list in your WhatsApp. Uh, really? Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, this is Akad. Academic session third, right? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, academic session third. Okay, third. So actually, uh, uh, okay. Now I can see here. Let me see again. Mm -hmm. Just a second. I will look at this. Okay, got, got it. Uh, 
there are 15 presenters, right? Yes, sir. Again, 15. So I yeah. should go one by one. Uh, all are ready, all presenters? Yeah, okay. I think ready, sir. I think ready. Okay. I think all are ready. Okay. Okay. Now the first research scholar, Abisa, COVID-19 and its impact on the Indian economic sectors. I think without any delay, uh, we have to uh, 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 this commence this session. Uh, Abisa, Abisa, is he or she around? <laughs> Abisa, this was his car. COVID-19 and its impact on the Indian economic sectors. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, sir. Uh, okay, uh, Abisa, uh, you can proceed with your presentation. Uh, am I audible to you? Abisa, you have? Yes, yes, yes. Madam, yes, yes. Uh, I, yes, and you have, please keep in mind you have six minutes. You have to finish it up within six minutes. Okay. Just come with key points, key findings, conclusion, and so on. Okay. Okay, so a uh, very warm good afternoon to everyone. So the topic today, uh, which I'm going to present is COVID-19 and its impact on the Indian economic sectors. So uh, starting with what is COVID-19. So coronavirus, it is a very infectious disease, uh, as we all know this by now. It was first identified uh, with an outbreak uh, in the Wuhan city of China. It was initially reported by WHO on December 31st, 2019. And later on March 11th, uh, this was uh, declared as a global pandemic. So uh, moving on, what uh, COVID-19 and India. So since uh, the world is right now in the middle of a global pandemic, and this has resulted in a severe health crisis, the nature of coronavirus is very infectious, which has caused the government right now all over the world to Im impose very strict policy measures that include there is social distancing, there is lockdown of public places and business centers, and there is limited transportation. The nationwide lockdown in developing countries like India, it has put a lot of pressure on almost all the financial sectors. There was a statement which was issued by the uh, IMF in, in March that the global recession due to coronavirus will be at least as bad as the uh, 2008 global financial crisis. The main, uh, my objective of the study is primarily to examine the effects of COVID-19 on various sectors of India and also to investigate the various challenges faced by these sectors. The data that has been collected from various government sectors, uh, various uh, government agencies and websites in general. So uh, starting on uh, COVID-19 and its impact, uh, since India exercised the lockdown at the very beginning of the global pandemic, so almost all the financial sectors, they faced a very serious blow. The foremost sector, which was uh, mainly affected was the agriculture sector. Uh, it was uh, very adversely affected. Uh, there was lack of migrant workers on the fields during the Ravi season. And uh, since majority of labor, they went home, so they, it caused a delay in the harvest of crops. Further, uh, since there were restrictions on the transport, it made it extremely difficult for the farmers to transport their crops from villages to Mandi. And there was a serious fall in the prices of crops. Also, uh, the poultry sector, uh, it, uh, it was very seriously affected because there was a uh, spread of false news uh, via social media that it helped in the spread of COVID-19. Another sector uh, that was affected was the aviation industry. Since uh, uh, there was immediate restriction on the movement and transportation, so it impacted the business of commercial airlines and the aviation sector. So the International Air Transport Association, that is the IATA, it estimated that the loss in India will be as huge as 13 billions due to the pandemic. Uh, majority airlines were cancelled and the, air, uh, the airlines fare it decreased and between 20 to 50 percent, including the domestic and the international flights. Between the period of February and March, the Ministry of Civil Aviation of the Government of India, it reported that almost over 580 flights 
they were canned. So uh, the aviation industry is one of the worst hit sectors among all the sectors. Another sector that is impacted is the tourism and the hospitality sector. Since uh, there was limitation on the movement and the travel, so the airline buses, uh, they were uh, restricted. There was a nationwide lockdown that was exercised. So this was the major reason behind the loss faced by the tourism and hospitality. Uh, hospitality sector. This was discussed uh, in great detail yesterday by a lot of researchers. Also, uh, a new work from home policy is uh, uh, is being recognized by all the firms and companies, which has led to the cancellation of all the business meeting and conferences, exhibitions, and this has increased the losses in the hospitality sector in India. And it has also led to a serious job cut in this sector. Another sector that has been impacted is the entertainment and the sports sector. Since all the public activities are suspended, so this sector has faced few losses. There is a closing of gymnasiums and cinema halls, movie halls. So all these areas, the, uh, the profits have taken a deep dive. Also, since uh, the shooting has been uh, suspended, the television and uh, film industry is also facing huge losses. There is uh, postponement of all the film releases and there is cancellation and discontinuation of shooting and promotional events. The, another sector that has been majorly hit right now is the retail and e-commerce sector uh, because uh, the e-commerce sector has faced a lot of adversities because there is lack of transportation. Uh, e right now there is a huge demand of home deliveries but due to the spread of COVID-19 and there is a shutdown of malls and shops, so it has caused a great deal of loss to the shop, shop owners and the retailers and has severely impacted the retail and the commerce sector. The Confederation of India, uh, of all India traders, it uh, uh, gave a statement that the seven crore traders uh, in the retail sector, they have faced losses as huge as five lakh crores between the months of March and May. Uh, moving on, uh, I would like to present some conclusions and su uh, suggestions. So the very first is uh, there should be uh, there should be discouragement or uh, any kind of the misinformation that is being spread via social media and the false rumors that are being spread. spread uh, they call the panic among the customers. So these uh, these rumors or misinformation should be uh, right now stopped and uh, totally discouraged. Also, the government should right now uh, provide financial aid to the sectors, uh, including the aviation industry and the retail sectors in terms of lower GST and tax because uh, they're right now currently facing huge losses. The government should also uh, right now facilitate uh, transportation and uh, shipment from abroad without any harm of the coronavirus because the exporters and retailers are largely dependent on them. Uh, moving on, the export and import of raw materials that are highly important to the industrial production of goods should be allowed uh, following the necessary precautions. So, uh, okay. I would like to conclude uh, my presentation here. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Abhisa. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, nice presentation. I think we'll move to the next one. Uh, Kalapan. Now, Alka Rai. Alka Rai. Alka. Yes, sir. Uh, please. Okay, sir. Alka, come with her presentation. An adverse effect of COVID-19 pandemic on agricultural markets in India, right? Okay. Six minutes. Okay, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Is my PPT visible, sir? Yes, Hello? it's visible to me. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to present a joint paper prepared by myself, Alka Rai, PhD scholar from the Department of Economics, Sikkim University, and Mr. Adash Rai, Assistant Professor, Department of Economics, Darjeeling College. So the topic of our paper is an adverse effect of COVID-19 pandemic on agriculture markets in India. As we all are on the ongoing pandemic, 
the COVID-19 pandemic has affected the lives of people and the economic sector globally. This paper discusses about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on India's agriculture sector. There is disruption in function of the agriculture markets due to imposition of lockdown in India from the end of March. Farmers were facing problems to sell their produce to the wholesale or weekly markets. Traders were also unable to go to purchase produce in the villages and due to which the producers are forced to sell their producers at lower prices in the village. As agriculture uh, markets are the major food suppliers and it has to function for ensuring supply of agro-goods, thus the government has decided to exempt agriculture markets from lockdown restrictions soon after three days of lockdown. But even after the exemption, there were no availability of labor and safe transportation facilities. Farmers were scared to move their produce to the mandis and lack of labor was another problem. Several wholesale markets were identified or suspected of um, as spreaders of coronavirus infection and thus they were closed. As a result, total market arrivals of footprints were comparatively less than previous year in most of the mandis and less arrivals of produce in mandis have caused the disruption in sale of produce, thereby causing high prices to the ultimate consumers. However, the government has initiated different measures in order to minimize the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. Some of the important measures are like under Pradhan Mantri Kishan scheme, rupees 2000 is credited to the accounts of farmers for financial support. Under Reserve Bank of India relief measures, agriculture loans have been granted a suspension of three months along with the session of 50%. Under PM Gari Kalyan Yojana, special care of the vulnerable section is taken care. Under Pradhan Mantri Kishan's migrant labor services with canning uh, foods, Mahatma Gandhi National Ruler Employment Guarantee Scheme was reassumed for migrant laborers. Now, objective of the present paper are to discuss the problems related to agriculture marketing, and it also discusses about the measures taken by Indian government so far. It also shows empirical evidence that how arrivals and prices of major food grains fluctuates during pre and post lockdown in India. The present okay. paper used daily data on arrivals and prices of three important food grains, namely rice, wheat, and gram, which cover several mandis of its major growing states like West Bengal, Uttar Pradesh, and Madhya Pradesh. The data have been analyzed using descriptive statistical tools. Now let us discuss its results. Arrivals and prices of rice in various mandis of West Bengal are there in this figures. The overall percentage decline between 2019 and 20 in the arrivals of rice is 47. There is fall in the arrivals of rice after the imposition of lockdown. And as a result of decline in arrivals, there is increase in the price of rice. Arrivals of wheat shows here that there is 7% decline as compared to last year and overall incline in price of rice is 6.4% between last and current year. Here, arrivals of gram fell by 93%. During months of March and April, the arrivals of gram is nil. Thus, hike in price of gram in Madhya Pradesh between 2019 and 2020 is 10.7%. In the present study, comparison is in the arrivals and prices of important food grains are made between the same month of the year 2019 and 20, and it is found that the degree of decline in arrivals varied across food grains. As a result of declining in uh, quantities of arrivals, there is an increase in volatility of the prices of food grains in markets of the selected states. And this is because of the disruption in supply chain due to shortage of labor and various lockdown restrictions. So the poor section of society are always victims of any disaster or pandemic situation like this. Hence the government should focus on these sectors by formulating some suitable policies to improve the functioning of agriculture markets. 
the government should be more prepared for such pandemic situations with cold storage facilities, food grains, banks, and subsidized agricultural inputs. And to avoid physical contact, producers and sellers should be encouraged to use online trading. And there should be less restriction of the APMC Act so that farmers can sell their produce directly to the consumers without any restrictions or fear during lockdown period in order to um, ease the burdens. So this much for my today's presentation. Thank you all. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alka. Uh, thank you, uh, sir. Presentation uh, finished up within six minutes. So thank you. Uh, now the now I would like to call up on uh, Kapesu. The first uh, name is difficult for me to pronounce. Kapesu, am I right, Kapesu? Yeah, yeah. Kapesu, <laughs> difficult for me. The first. Can you pronounce? How, how would you pronounce the first name? It's Ngoni Zashe. Ngoni Zashe. Difficult for me. Anyway, <laughs> Kapesu, I know the title of the paper topic: uh, COVID-19 on rural livelihoods, right? And the agro sector in Southern Africa. Southern Africa. Good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good, 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 good. Research scholar, university. Okay. Go ahead, please, with your presentation. Okay. Am I Which part of South Africa you are there? Uh, I'm from Zimbabwe. South from... Africa? Yeah, I'm from Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I had met some friends right, from Zimbabwe as well while I was studying in Australia, you know? Okay, please okay. go ahead. Okay, okay. Uh, let me share my screen. Six minutes, okay? Keep it in mind. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see. Okay, thank you. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Ngorinza Shika uh, from the Republic of Zimbabwe. I'm here to present uh, on the impacts of COVID on agriculture and rural livelihoods. Uh, I'm currently studying at uh, Dubruga University under the Department of Sociology. So this is the... Uh, this is the, the title of my paper. And uh, my paper, my presentation is... Uh, uh, Hello. Hello. Can I proceed? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. Please go ahead. Okay, the, the, my presentation is in three parts. Uh, first of all, uh, I will discuss uh, the background of Southern Africa prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Then I will go into the impacts of uh, COVID-19 on rural livelihoods as well as on agriculture. Then uh, lastly, I will focus on the coping strategies to ease the impacts of the pandemic on rural agriculture and rural livelihoods. Uh, it should be noted that uh, it is equally difficult to understand the impacts of COVID-19 uh, crisis on rural livelihoods in uh, isolation. So discussing these issues, uh, there is need for a holistic approach. So these are the object objectives of my paper and objectives of this presentation. One is to understand the nature of livelihoods in rural to understand the nature of livelihood options in rural Southern Africa prior to the outbreak of COVID-19. Then the second objective is to examine the impacts of COVID-19 on rural livelihoods and agriculture in the region. Then to determine the coping strategies uh, to ease this, the impacts on agriculture and uh, livelihoods. This is the general background of the study. These are the countries in Southern Africa. As you can see, there's Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, Switzerland, uh, and others. So this is just a summary of the, the background of rural areas uh, in Southern Africa prior to the outbreak. Then as you can see, 
Uh, the first uh, is on uh, the informal nature of work in agriculture and other life options. This is one of the basic facets that uh, in Southern Africa. There is also lack of proper healthy and sanitation services for the general rural populace, which will intensify the impacts of COVID-19. There is also the digital divide. There is lack of uh, any kind of social safety needs. Then uh, most of the rural inhabitants in Southern Africa depend on mobile life route. Then uh, politically speaking, most of the countries, there's bad governance, corruption, and uh, a lot of things in politics. Then the region is also suffering from previous uh, effects of uh, previous Hello. outbreaks, such as cholera, HIV, Hello. and non, uh, other non communicable diseases. Then there is also political uh, chaos. It is important to note that uh, all these affirmations uh, make it harder for law in the region to follow uh, containment measures such as curfews, stay at home measures, self isolation is a is, um, uh, curfews. Hello, sir. So these are the land route options in Southern Africa. Okay, sir. Uh, there are options. Okay. There are options that are related to agriculture. Then there are other options, livelihood options that are non-agri. So the subsistence farming, pastoralism, market gardening, horticulture, and dairy farming that is related to agriculture. Then on the other hand, there is uh, roadside vending, small scale aquaculture, apiculture, small retail shops, artisanal mining, as well as remittances. Uh, uh, and coming up with this paper, a qualitative approach was used, and uh, the method of data gathering was the recursive content ab abstraction method. Then uh, the keywords that I used in coming up with uh, this review paper were library was COVID-19 in Southern Africa, agriculture, and implications. Then uh, I'll go on to the second part of the presentation, that is uh, the major part of the presentation, that is the impacts of COVID-19 on uh, rural inhabitants in Southern Africa, as well as uh, those involved in agriculture. So COVID-19 uh, led to the disruption of input supply chains uh, to farmers. There was the disruption of input supply chain. It also led to the disruption of market chains uh, as well as a uh, closer closer of local markets, each, for example, religious gatherings, schools, and shops. It also led to the increased risk of post post harvest loss uh, due to the containing containing measures and uh, that were adopted by various juris jurisdictions in several countries in Southern Africa. Then there were also losses related to perishability of the products, especially for what culturalists, uh, dairy farmers, as well as uh, market gardeners. A lot of losses were incurred uh, by these uh, uh, farmers in rural areas because of uh, the restrictions in movements. Then uh, uh, the restrictions in movements uh, also disturb the, the normal movement of pastoralists in uh, countries such as Namibia, as well as uh, in some parts of Botswana, where pastoralism is um, a livelihood option. Uh, then again, uh, the disruption of the, 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 uh, the disruption uh, in movements uh, um, disturbed the movement of agricultural sovereign staff, such as the veterinary officers and uh, as well as agricultural extension officers. Then uh, due to lockdowns, due to curfews, as well as retrenchments that uh, were as a result of this COVID-19, there was the reduction in the amount of remittances in countries uh, and uh, border provinces uh, uh, in most countries that depend on these remittances. For example, in the southern part of Zimbabwe, as well as some parts of Mozambique, where most of the, the, the people, they depend on remittances from the neighboring uh, economic hub, that is South Africa. Then um, uh, COVID-19 also uh, reduced the demand of fresh produce due to the closure of uh, tourism resort areas, such as hotels, restaurants, and 
Another, another impact was uh, it altered uh, the transboundary trade affecting uh, road, roadside vendors because uh, these uh, people usually rely on uh, uh, transboundary trade as well as uh, vehicles. When vehicles were stopped, when there were restrictions in movement, uh, this affected uh, roadside vendors. Then it also led to, uh, it, it reduced female participation and uh, productive labor, labor due to this emergence. There was the closure of schools and uh, now women uh, be at the bedding of looking after children who, who are no longer going to school. So in most cases, like in most countries in Africa, in Southern Africa, schools were closed and uh, pupils are now sitting at home. Uh, which is a direct bearing on, uh, on women's uh, productive uh, uh, labor. Then uh, it also increased the insecurity of uh, vulnerable min minorities. Then uh, uh, this is the last part of my presentation on the, and it is on the coping okay. mechanism, <clears throat> coping strategies. Uh, I, uh, social protection is the most immediately needed intervention in Southern Africa. It can be in form of cash transfers, it can be in form of free health services or food handouts because COVID-19 uh, has uh, directly and adversely uh, disrupted uh, the food production systems as I earlier on highlighted. Then uh, rural levels need support through uh, emergence employment, for example, uh, food for work programs can, can be utilized. Then another way to assist is through anticipatory exchange that is aimed at preventing deteriorating and emerging food crisis. Then uh, government can also work on providing subsidies to farmers in the ongoing, uh, oncoming planting season. Then uh, since uh, most businesses are now done online, there's also need to make data tariffs affordable and accessible to the rural populace. Then uh, I also found these two initiatives uh, with uh, explaining the hand in hand initiative as well as the appreciative in inquiry. This is a bottom up uh, approach that governments as well as uh, humanitarian agencies can use to ease the impacts of uh, COVID-19. Uh, the hand in hand initiative is an evidence-based, country-led and country-owned initiative to accelerate uh, the achievement of uh, SDG number one uh, on poverty and SDG number two on uh, hunger. Uh, this is done using the most sophisticated tools available, including advanced geospatial modeling to identify the biggest opportunities and to raise income and reduce the inequalities and the vulnerabilities of rural populations. Then another, uh, another, another, another approach that can be used is this appreciative inquiry. Appreciative inquiry is a highly inclusive process that maximizes the positives as opposed to minimizing the negative, in which communities, communities uh, take responsibility for generating and gathering information and then forms strategies are uh, based on the most positive experiences of the past. Uh, since uh, we had, uh, since the region has a lot of experiences uh, from previous pandem pandemics such as cholera, uh, HIV, uh, uh, typhoid, so uh, countries can learn from the, the, those previous pandemics and uh, uh, make their way uh, forward. Uh, this marks the end uh, of okay. my presentation, but I will, and in conclusion, I will just say in both the immediate and longer term impacts, uh, protecting and supporting life rules will require a combination of social protection interventions uh, to protect income, provision of food and other immediate needs to prevent negative coping strategies and measures to support production and access to employment such as public waste through, throughout the agricultural food system then it is also important to note that uh, minimizing uh, the disruption of farming operations, enabling access to production inputs as well as uh, produce markets by farming households are some of these uh, mechanisms that uh, uh, Southern African member states are planning to strengthen their agricultural sector, which has been grossly affected by the pandemic. 
This can also be done to adapt and mitigate the impact of the pandemic on supply chains associated with uh, low levels. Uh, this uh, marks the end of my presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, research scholar. With the case yeah, of yeah. Southern, Southern Africa, the yeah, yeah, yeah. livelihood, exit sector. Thank you so much. Okay. okay. Next presenter, okay. please. Um, from Nagaland, <laughs> women entrepreneurs in Koima, right? Uh, a discussion on the impacts of COVID-19 on women's entrepreneurs. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Devi, Devi, Devi Lono. Sir, it's Devi Lono. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, please. Come with up. Come with your presentation, please. Sir, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. So is my screen visible? Not yet. Skin not yet. No, yeah, yeah. Now, now it's, it's okay. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, respected chairperson, respected coordinator and his team, yeah. thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Okay, sir. Okay, okay sir. Well, my name is Divileno. I'm an assistant professor from St. Joseph's College, Autonomous Jakama Nagaland. The topic of my presentation today is looking beyond the pandemic, a discussion on the impact of COVID-19 on women entrepreneurs in Kohima, Nagaland. My area of study is Kohima town in its neighboring villages. The reason why I selected Kohima as my area is because it is the administrative capital of Nagaland. It is the educational and political hub, one of the many. What is wrong with Devi? Hello? Hello? Dr. Dinesh? Yeah, sir. I think there is a network problem, I think. Network problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think, I think. Network problem with Devi, right? Yeah. Shall we go to the next one or wait for Devi? Yes, sir. Hello. Yes. Sir. Yeah. Yes, please. Move to next one, I think. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. We, we'll see, okay. Now, next one, Ashwini. Ashwini Kumar, Kumar Boyari, right? This is impact of poverty and poverty. Sir, Patok sir. Ashwini. Yes. No, yeah, sir, he's not available. Ashwini not available? Okay. Yeah, yeah, move to next one. Then, Jagbir Singh. Yeah, Jagbir Singh, yeah. Yes, sir, I am audible. Okay, please. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, audible, yeah. yeah. Okay, Please. sir. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am audible. Yeah, yeah, audible. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, sir. I am Jagbi Singh from Kushetra University, research scholar. And uh, my topic is uh, COVID-19 in during times of uh, Menrega in COVID-19. Uh, sir, my topic is Menrega in times of COVID-19. Sir, during this time, Manrega role very important. All of the program government run, but Manrega uh, program, you see, in present time, it's a very important role. All of the workers who are migrant come from cities to any villages, 
and they have no food they have no job they are helpless they are needless and they are voiceless some people in news you have to every day see but manrega comes in 2005 and it was act in 2006 and uh, the government of india to october 2009 changed the scheme name in the name of mahatma gandhi mahatma gandhi's ideology is that uh, any country can not development uh, without his rural development because india is a very big country and uh, 70% of the population lives in the villages and gandhi ji ideology said that if we want progress and development of the country we cannot achieved without the development of rural economy so manrega is the step of government to development the rural economy manrega schemes provide 100 days guarantee employment for all adults 15 to 59 age pupils that want to do work this scheme is only for unskilled worker those who are un killed and unemployment anyone can be registered in this scheme and can get employment first of all what have he have to done he have to go in his village panchayat and uh, apply for job card after getting job card he will be able to get work if the in the 15 days government uh, or gram gram panchayat not uh, provide his him Uh, job then the unemployment allowance will be provided by the government according to the government scheme in 2005 it starts uh, 200 districts of poorest in the india in first phase and uh, in 2007 8 an addition 130 district added in the scheme and in th- third phase 274 districts were added in the scheme on the sir 2000 281 rupees per day minimum wage but recently government increased 20 rupees per worker and haryana is the only state where the worker 307 rupees highest level of wages and bihar and chatisgarh and some are state which are the very low rate sir during the covid 19 migrant worker affected internal migrant worker according to data 30.51 crore according to census 2011 this 37% total population of india who returned their home back uttar pradesh bihar rajasthan madhya pradesh major state they come back in their villages now the significance of the manrega scheme according to article 41 indian constitution it provide all citizen to right to work and manrega scheme is different before manrega government have employed many schemes but manrega is different we it's only those people get job who are a job card and it employs within 15 days of demand for work manrega is a demand based scheme while other schemes are allocation based before manrega scheme the major aim of manrega is providing work for those rural who can't find any other work now the goals of manrega what are the goals increase social equality uplifting the living standard of weaker section provide jobs in 5 km area reducing migration enhancement of job security and who are the people who can apply in this scheme these are some no nomadic tribe group people denotified tribes primitive tribal groups individual with disability and senior citizen is about 65 years hi positive including and and the which type of work they can do like uh, water conserv- conservation and water harvesting drought proofing irrigation consultants provision of irrigation faculty and land development flood control and rural connectivity agriculture related works 
like fishery, rural sanitation. These are some work which are can be done by the Manrega in work. Now the main finding or main my study is during COVID-19, economics crisis weakest circle impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Economic slowdown everywhere is economic slowdown because there is no demand, no production, no investment, no employment, no income. So these weakest circle of employment all around. And first of all, when people have no income, how can he consumption? When no consumption, no demand to so these circles are evolved. Now the Manrega during initial phase of lockdown, April 2020. In first phase, Manrega works related to individual beneficiary scheme required a handful of laborers work continued with strict observation of social distancing norm, use of hand wash, soap, mask, etc. And national scenario in April 2020, 110.46 lakh household who were provided 14.10 crore percent days of employment under Manrega. This translates into 12.76 days of average employment per household in April 2020. Whereas in April 2019, 170.36 lakh household worked under got 27.39 crore person days of employment per HH in April 2019. Sir, I am audible. Hello. 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 Yes, Jagbir. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, please finish it up. N next, uh, May 2020. In May 2020, employment under Manrega has taken complete U-turn as this is the only source of employment in rural areas. Folks has increased to provide new job cards or addition of names returned workers to their family, exciting job work. In case of Bihar, a total of 5,75,528 new job cards have been issued. One of these, 1,52,748 job cards have been issued for workers staying quarantine camp and names of 48,910 workers have been added to exciting job cards of their family till date 13, 13,0975 migrant labor have been provided employment under Manrega. Government okay. of India has... Yes, sir. Yes, sir, one minute. Government of, government of India has Please. launched Atam Nirbhar and it Jagbir. has made... Yes, Jagbir. sir. Yes, sir. Time one minute. We want to conclude. Okay. So, I have made two graphs, uh, lack of shortage of times, uh, so I cannot conclude. In a very simple words, uh, I conclude my topic. Include in conclusion, we can say Manrega in times of COVID-19 has a major role. Everywhere the atmospheres are gloomy and frustration and no work in any sector due to COVID-19. Manrega scheme helped the migrant worker and the weaker section of the society. COVID-19 affected the every aspect of life and job are affected mostly. Now people want some job or work, only Manrega scheme helped these helpless and jobless person. Government announces many relief for the poor people, but they are not sufficient. Manrega has many drawbacks. Beside many drawbacks, okay. uh, it's a very good security scheme and help the poor people and the needy people. Thank and you, Jagdeep. Thank you, thank you. Thank okay, you. Sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Okay. okay. So next presenter, Sher Ghimire. COVID-19 impact of COVID-19, a global challenge, food crisis. Sir, give me a... Sir? Yes, please. Okay, good. Am I audible, yes. sir? Okay, yeah, I can see you. Please. Sir, I will share my screen. Okay, please. Okay. So, I should start now? Yes, please. Let's Chairman, my guru, 
Dr. Ramsharan Patak, <laughs> Management Committee of the Camp Gosaigao Campus, distinguished speakers, sors, madams, presented scholars. Namaste. My name is Sergi Mire. I'm a student of Population Studies, Tribune University of Nepal. Today, I'm going to present you impact of COVID-19, a global challenge on food crisis. We all, all are aware that the coronavirus that first traced from Wuhan, China on 17th November 2019 has spread in 216 countries, infecting more than 16.5 million people with mortality 6,056 thousand people as of today as per the WHO record. Due to this COVID lockdown, there, there was a massive uh, disruption in rice plantation in Nepal due to the shortage and seed, manpower, and the fertility. Also the flood, particularly from poor embankment in the bordering rivers between India and Nepal has damage the huge amount of the food. Also, COVID-19 has impacted severely in supply chain, according to the International Chambers of Shipping, as reported by Ms. Elena Becketors in times, more than 300,000 ships have been stranded in the ocean. This is going to impact on food distribution, allocations, quality of the food, and this will lead to the price increment also, we have already the existing food shortage. According to the World Food Program, record 135 million people from 55 countries did have food shortage. If not responded correctly, this figure will increase to 265 million. And this figure is huge. Unfortunately, our neighboring countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Pakistan are on this list. This year also we record that unwanted guest called locust has started from East Africa, has infested 27 countries, including Nepal and India. According to the food security and nutrition analysis unit of Somalia estimated that more than 19,000 metric ton food has been destroyed by these locust. That would be sufficient for 281,000 people for six months. Du during this COVID lockdown, United Nations Fund for Population Activities has estimated more than 47 million women did not have family planning access. As a result, 7 million unintended pregnancies happened. Of course, Nepal and India has the share on this, I believe. Nepal need to welcome our returning migration workers According to the data, there are more than 236,000 Nepali workers in abroad. These figures excludes Nepalis working in India. If we receive them, our national revenue will decrease by US dollar 8 billion annually. This means that we are losing our purchasing power, increasing the unemployment rate, which is already 11.4%. According to the study of World Food Program, one in 10 Nepalis has lost the job due to the COVID-19. This means that limitedly produced food, difficultly distributed food have to be shared with increasing number of people with minimum purchasing power. According to the World Food Program, Nepal's study among 4,416 people, there are already 23% people did not have sufficient meal. 7% of out of them did not have dietary diversity. This means these numbers has increased than the previous years. I have, I have offered these following seven solutions. We need to in focus on in inventing COVID-19 vaccines. If not individually, then maybe SARC nations can do this together. We can utilize medical science or herbal medicals. We need to receive our migration workers, engage them in productive sector sectors, maybe in scientific agriculture, so to enjoy our population dividend and social harmony. 
We also need to enhance the capacity of local transporter, transporters. So the food distribution will help to the needy ones. I strongly believe that a joint task force study committee between India and Nepal requires to, to the study of embankments of the border and rivers to prevent the huge amount of foods that has been lost during few years, both in Nepal and India. Time has come for our leaders to stand collaboratively to fulfill basic human needs as well as human rights. I also request our governments in South Asia to punish these, those corrupt leaders and staff who are fulfilling their personal needs from the public properties. We need to support not only ourselves, but to support those 135 million people around the 55 countries. Thank you. Thank you, Shir. Thank you so much for the excellent presentation. I think, okay. Next presenter, please. Dr. Dipanjali. Now, Dr. Dipanjali. Dr. Dipanjali. Dipanjali. Yes, sir. I am. Uh, yes, sir. I am here, sir. Please. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yes, please sir. proceed with your presentation. Okay. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. Gender sir, implications is it visible, of COVID-19 my... pandemic. Yes, sir. I can is see it visible, you. Sir? Is it visible, sir? Uh, my pre uh, my uh, my slides. slides are yeah. visible, sir. Yes, sir. Not yet. Not not no, not, not, yet. Yet. not yet. Not yet. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. So I, I am presenting some without showing the slides, sir. There are some Good. problems I am facing. Okay, no okay, problem, sir. please. Dipanjali. Okay, sir. Respected. Okay, sir. I am going to present. Respected sir, person, sir, and all other dignitaries in the panelists and my fellow participants who are present in this dais. So I am going to present gender implications of COVID-19 pandemic. So, yep. as you know, the COVID-19, as a, though it is a health pandemic, it, is, it has devastating effects on every sphere of life at individual, family, social, economic, political, and international level. So, considering this background, I am, I am going to explain how it has effect on gender, both male and female, and uh, here, in, in my study, I have used the secondary data. I have used secondary data from different sources in national and international level. And here, I have found that more male fatalities than female fatalities. Female fatal male fatalities are more than female fatalities. And in India, according to Ministry of Health data, male made up about 75% both cases and death respectively. And in, in a, yesterday, one of our resource person also explained that that increases as the age also increases. So there is a positive relationship regarding death due to COVID-19 and and age. And what are the causes? Though the causes are not very clear till now, but the preliminary research point out that pre-existing health condition or chronic diseases, uh, risky health-seeking behavior among men lack of consciousness about hygiene as well as genetic and immunological differences are found responsible for such fatalities. Again, considering women and girls, so women and girls can be affected in a particular way and in some cases face more negative impacts than men. So they are affected, women and girls are affected from different perspective and I have I, I try to discuss some of the aspects how they are affected so here consider the economic effects so here as you know globally women earn less save less hold less secure jobs and are more likely to be employed in informal sector 
they are not socially protected. As women take on greater care demands at home, their jobs will also be disproportionately affected by cuts and layoffs. Such impacts risks rolling back the already fragile gains made in labor force participation, limiting women's ability to support themselves and their families, especially for female-headed households. And another aspect that is health impacts. So during this period, women are more likely to expose different types of health hazards directly and indirectly as a result of this pandemic. So there is occupational health hazard as number of women are a large number of women that is all over the world about 70 percent of health, health workforce are working as frontline health workers especially nurses midwife midwives and community health workers and health facility services so uh, services so they are more vulnerable to expose this disease and another one, sexual and reproductive health. So the diversion of resources to meet the public health emergency becomes the challenge to meet antenatal care, delivery care, postnatal care, sexual health services or family planning and other critical services. As I have attended one uh, webinar of IUSSP last day, last yesterday in the evening, there was a discussion regarding on, on this topic and I have found that about 12,200 to 56,700 additional maternal deaths uh, may, it may be uh, are occur due to this pandemic and 13 to 15 million additional women denied to contraceptive supplies 0.3 to 15 million additional unintended pregnancies, 3.3 million additional unsafe abortions, and 1,000 additional unsafe abortions, uh, abortion-related maternal deaths. So these may, these are the data. Again, gender-based violence and exploitation. So during this period, due to Define causes, economic and social stresses, and measure to restrict contact and movement. Women and girls are facing different types of exploitation, physical, sexual, emotional, cyber trafficking, etc. So in, there is this. This is regarded as silent pandemic. Again, the unpaid care works. Women are working as a default unpaid family caregivers and a majority of unpaid and poorly paid community health workers like ASA workers and Anganbadi workers in, in India. They have to look after children because of closure of school, old parents and uh, recent data shows that adult skin girls spend significantly more hours on sores compared to their male counterparts. It could also lead to millions more girls dropping out of school before they complete their education, especially girls living in poverty, girls with disabilities or living in rural isolated locations. Again, girls are less likely to receive intra-household educational resources over boys. Another one that is due to this pandemic, there might be increased child early and forced marriage due to economic downturn and stalling implementation of programs. Again, again regarding marginal workers, a large number of marginal workers, predominantly women, are facing tremendous hurdles because of travel restrictions and self-isolation. And I, older women, they are more likely to, they, are, they have lower and no pension and live in poverty, face tremendous problem to access protective items, food, water, information and health services. So policy measures, I have uh, studied number of papers or reports like World Bank, uh, World Bank policy notes, interagency standing committees, interim, guide, interim uh, guidance, United Nations policy brief, uh, they have um, these reports recommended number of measures and I have stated some of the measures. First one is inclusion and representation of women in all national responses plans and prioritize their rights, social and economic outcomes, equality and protection. 
Secondly, drive transformative change for equality by addressing care economy, paid and unpaid. Target women and girls in all efforts to address the socio-economic impacts of COVID-19. So this is about my presentation, sir. Good, thank you. I like to conclude here, sir. Okay, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Dipanjali, right? Dipanjali, Dr. Yes, sir. Dipanjali. Okay, yes, sir, thank you so okay. much for your yes, nice, sir. nice presentation, nice presentation, even with our slides. So went smoothly. Yes. So no, next, next presenter, please. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next presenter, uh, Salkia, right? Salkia. The last name is easy for me to pronounce. Salkia, COVID-19 and its impact on the agricultural land use in land use. Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, I think uh, she, she is absent. She is absent. She is absent. Yeah, okay. move, to the next, move to the next one. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. Next one is Dr. Manalisa. Manalisa. Yeah. Dr. Manalisa, is she? Is he or she? She, right? She, she, she. Yeah. Strategy to fight against COVID-19 crisis. Manalisa. Dr. Manalisa. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Sir. Come up with that presentation. Yeah. Please. Go ahead. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. The title of my paper is Atmanirbhar Bharat Ovizan, a strategy Good. to fight against COVID-19 crisis. Yeah. COVID-19 pandemic is not just a health catastrophe. It is affecting societies and economics at their core. This pandemic has translated into major economic shock that has affected both supply and demand. Therefore, every COVID-19 affected countries undertaken immediate development response with an eye to the future. In India, Narendra Modi government viewed this COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity to achieve economic self-reliance and announced for Bharat Ovision as a strategy to recover the economy from COVID-19 pandemic with an objective to recognize the importance of local manufacturing, local market, and local supply chains through the mantra, vocal for local. Uh, in this paper, an attempt has been made to explore this new mission of self-reliance as a strategy to revive the country's economy and also focuses whether this mission of self-reliance can be affordable for India. And for methodology part, we have taken secondary data collected from various reports of the Gov of India, mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. websites, newspaper, and various studies. Now come to what Modi's Atmanirbhar Bharat Ovizan. To tackle the economic breakdown led by COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent lockdown, uh, Narendra Modi government announced an economic package on 12th May 2020 bought rupees uh, 20 lakh crore or 10% of India's GDP in 2019-20, aiming to reboot all the sections of the society, including middle class, MSME, laborers, farmers, and the industry. According to him, this mission of self-reliance is consist of five pillars, economy, number two, infrastructure, number three, technology-driven system, number four, vibrant demography, and the last pillar is demand. Mm -hmm. The Atmanibhar package is such that the first trends is consist of rupees uh, 5,94,554, and this set of relief measures focused on enabling the MSME sector of Indian economy. And the second trends consist of rupees 3,10,004, 3, and this this is for migrant workers and street vendors. And the third front of group is 1,50,000 crore catered to agriculture and allied sectors. Fourth and fifth fronts of majors, what group is 1,50,000 crore 
focused on reforms for sectors including coal, mineral, defense production, air space management, airport, MRO, space sector, and atomic energy. Uh, although Modi's Atmanitmar Bharat vision may remain activity COVID-19 and create new opportunities for good, but several challenges are associated with it. Uh, number one is issues of liquidity. Uh, in, in this economic package, majority is liquidity measures. Uh, they are supposed to be transmitted by RBI to banks and banks to citizens. So this transfer of liquidity would not be as smooth owing to uh, inefficient transmission of monetary policy. And the number two is lack of demand. As the package mainly focused on credit infusion to boost the economy, it has failed to recognize that investment will grow up only when people across income segments have money to spend. And the third, uh, third drawback is in inadequate backward and forward linkages. The MSME sectors may face to shortage of demand and its production may soon scooter to close because the COVID affected domestic economy will take time to revive. And the last, uh, another of the uh, drawback is unaddressed India's middle class. A large number of India's middle class uh, organized sectors are facing heavy pay cut, job losses, a sharp fall in income and uncertainty, but they will not get anything substantial from this package. Uh, many economists say that if this new self-reliance mission is a retreat from globalization, then this can be a slippery slope for Indian business. Uh, they view that we should not be rocking the very foundation of the open economy, which has been built with careful calibration. Uh, so from the above discussion, we may conclude that this stimulus package of rupees 20 lakh crore under the Atmanirbhar Bharat Obisan mission may impacted all the three sectors, uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Uh, in the primary sector, by focusing the one nation, one market objective will help India become the food factory of the world and finally help in achieving the goal of self-sustainable rural economy. Uh, in the secondary sector, by giving rupees three lakh for a uh, collateral free loan facility for MSME, uh, will help to sustain the labor-intensive industries and thereby help in leveraging India's comparative advantage. And finally, the tertiary sector is also not excluded from this stimulus package. So the government has uh, adopted a balanced approach in addressing concerns across sectors such as education and public health. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, thank thank you, you Dr. Manalisha. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Now, Dr. Jayashree, Dr. Jayashree. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes please, Dr. Jayashree. COVID-19 and agriculture sector, right? Your topic is related to COVID-19, agriculture sector? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Proceed with your presentation. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, sir, I will not be able to share the screen. No problem, you can actually. Hello, speak. sir. Okay, I can hear you. Sir, can you hear me? Yes. Clearly, I can hear you. We can hear you. I think I can hear you. <laughs> Jai Shri. Yeah, sir. So, uh, my topic is uh, COVID-19 and agriculture sector in India, sir. Yeah. So, uh, before me to two presenters, uh, Ms. Alka Rai and uh, Mr. Ghimire, they have talked about uh, food security and the yeah. problems faced by agriculture sector. So my paper yeah. is also on deadline only. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, COVID-19 pandemic has uh, affected around 16 to 17 lakhs people in the country. And uh, the, we all know that the Indian economy has been badly hit by it. So while all other sectors are equally important from the economy, for growth of the economy, all sectors are equally important. But in India, agriculture is considered as the backbone of the Indian economy. Not only because that it provides livelihood, but it, it is also because it provides foods to millions and earnings to the economy through the exports of agricultural products. 
Now, if we go to the literature on other pandemics, effects of other pandemics, we have uh, studies by United Nations and other global agencies which have shown that the agriculture sector has been badly affected. The breakage of market change, shortage of labor, and other key factors. Now, the object I have only two objectives in this paper to analyze the problems faced by the farmers during this period and to study the trend of agricultural exports in India from May 2019 to April 2020 and compare this export with previous year. And uh, I have uh, done my study on uh, strictly based on secondary data, which I have collected from tradingeconomics.com and from the Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Government of India. And I have also consulted newspaper articles. Now for the effect on farmers, uh, I have uh, taken a study conducted by Harvard P.A. Chan School of Public Health Boston in collaboration with Public Health Foundation of India and Center for Sustainable uh, Agriculture. This study was conducted between May 3rd and May 15th of 2020 among 1,500 farmers in 200 districts across 12 states of Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Gujarat, Haryana, Karnataka, Madhya Pradesh, Maharashtra, Punjab, Rajasthan, Telangana, Uttar Pradesh, and West Bengal. That means it has covered uh, almost all the major states of the country of North, South, East, West. And it was found in the study that for harvest and yield, 55% of the farmers were forced to store their crops. They were not able to sell. And more than 50 farmers who harvested their crops suffered a yield loss compared to the previous year. And this, uh, the cause of this ill loss was uh, cited as the lack of labor, problem of storage, and limited or zero transportation options. We all know that because of lockdown, they were not able to transport their goods. So, and in the wheat producing states of Bihar, Haryana, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and Uttar Pradesh, except Punjab, only around 10 to 18 percent of farmers were able to sell their crops. That means 90, sorry, 80 percent of the farmers were not able to sell their crops. And in the non-wheat producing states, that is like West Bengal, which are vegetable producing states, more than 80 percent suffered a huge loss because the vegetables could not be stored. They they rotten and they had to throw away. And the cost of harvest, around 80 percent of the farmers say that the process of harvesting cost more compared to last season because lack of farmer, lack of labor, because we know due to pandemic, outbreak of pandemic, there has a migration of laborers or machinery or higher cost of machinery. And, but only around 20% of the farmers said that their costs have decreased because they have shifted to family labor. Now, about the apprehensions about the future, these farmers, more than 60% of the farmers anticipated that these problems of agriculture like labor shortage and unavailability or high cost of seeds and fertilizers is going, going to continue. Now I'd like to, since I'm from Assam, uh, I'd like to focus the situation in Assam. Assam has suffered the rot of lockdown undoubtedly, but with that, coupled with that, the flood situation in Assam is so bad that it has affected movement of individuals and vehicles and this flood situation has devastated Assam and its agriculturists. Vegetables have rotten in the field due to lack of market in the lockdown period. That is a different thing. But the paddy fields are also destroyed. So the agriculture sector in Assam is in a very gloom state. And regarding the export uh, objective to export of agricultural products from May 2019 to April 2020, I'm not able to share the diagram. We have been going steady since May 2019, but uh, in the month of April and May, there has been a sharp decline, sir. There has been a sharp decline in the agricultural export products, and India has suffered a major balance of trade deficit here. And <laughs> compared to the previous years, in 2016-17, India exported 33,282 3 billion dollars in 17 18 38000 billion dollars in 1819 also it's slightly increased to 38739 but this year sir from last uh, may 2019 to april 20 only 6000 sir we have suffered 32000 us dollar loss in export 
So my conclusion is that this discussion brings home the fact that the pandemic has affected the agriculture sector of the country and lack of coal, so uh, coal storage facilities, among others, is one of the main reasons. We know that losses are huge, economy is in its doom, and the farmers are the worst hit. Policies announced by the central government uh, by Mrs. Nirmala Sitaram are very promising, but everything depends on the control and eviction of coronavirus. We need the policies engulfed with research in vaccine, but I think prayers we prayers are also one of the hope. We need to pray. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Yeah, Jay Shri. Okay. Yeah, and thank so you. I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Dinesh Das for giving me the opportunity to present the paper. And sir, I, I, have, I have enjoyed your session also from yesterday onwards. Yeah. I have missed any session. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Dr. Yeah. Yeah, Thank your you. name is very good name, Jay Shri. You know, Jay yeah. Shri. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Now, Indrani. Indrani. Yes, sir. Indrani. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah. Sir. Please. Impacts of COVID, COVID on e business. Start, right? start my video. Indrani. Start my video. Indrani. Indrani Devi. Yes, sir. Yes, please. Good afternoon to one and all present here. Here and yeah. special thanks to the organizer of this conference. Today, yeah. the topic of my paper is impact of COVID-19 pandemic on e-commerce in India. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In spite of brick and motor stores being hit hard by latest crisis, the case of e-commerce has been pretty dynamic. The entire e-commerce industry has been trying its best to be efficient and mitigate the consequences of the crisis. The efficiency of e-commerce industry in India has been continuously in the spotlight too. The object of my study is to study the role played by e-commerce during the COVID-19 situations, to examine the issues faced by e-commerce in India, and to examine factors for growth of e-commerce in India. Now, a survey conducted by National Retail Federations shows that nine in 10 consumers have changed their traditional shopping habits. More than 50% of consumers have ordered product online that they would normally purchase at the store. Nearly six in 10 consumers say they are worried about going to the store due to fear of being infected. Now the role played by e-commerce during COVID-19 are online food delivery platforms like Swiggy and Jamato have turned into contactless deliveries from the prevalent fears associated with personal safety and hygiene. Amazon and Flipkart and many others have also shifted to the marketing of indispensable items and instrumental in delivery of pharmaceuticals and other important things. It has also been a rise in the orders of appearances like routers and cables for people who are working from home. Some of the wholesalers in India also took the opportunity of e-commerce during these periods and also established their network with this online platform by linking the reputed producers with the business, which decreases the cost of the whole business process. Now, the challenges of e-commerce in India are some of the challenges, mode of payment difficulties are there, poor internet connection, customer satisfactions. If the satisfaction of the customers is hard once, then it will be difficult, difficult to gain it back. Lack of smartphone, less awareness, lack of digital infrastructure. Now, some of the suggestions are higher internet penetrations and increased use of smartphone. 5G and IoT system has to be developed in India. The customer satisfaction has to be given topmost priority. Safe and secure payment gateways has to be ensured. The integration of markets of different sectors in the rural areas on the e-commerce platform has to be done. New innovative business should be developed. For example, Momo King, a QSR chain, has reassessed its business plan and is focusing its energies into initiating Cloud Kitchen's model to cater to its delivery-only process. Now, the conclusion is the environment created by COVID-19 pandemic may last for a long time, 
and we must convert the challenges faced during this period to an opportunity and e-commerce will inevitably be adapted to the new environment. The pandemic has also made it clear that e-commerce can be a useful tool both for consumers and producers, not only in times of crisis, but also it is an economic driver both for large and small business in India. Thus, to continue, the growth of e-commerce industry in India during the pandemic and thereafter, and to integrate the production and distribution sense into e-commerce platform by restructuring and expanding IT facilities to all parts of the country. All the agencies have to work together so that the consumers pay the actual price for the commodity they purchase and the producers or sellers also get right price for their product. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Indrani. Uh, nice presentation. And finish it off <laughs> within 60 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. The next presenter, please. Thank Dr. You, Pinky. Dr. Pinky. Yes, sir. Are you there? Yeah. yeah. I yeah. Please, please. I'll share the screen. Come with your pre pre presentation. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Dr. Pinky. Right? Yes, sir. COVID-19 and SDG 13, climate change. Okay. So is my screen visible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Greetings, sir, Patak sir, and all the panelists and all the participants. So the presentation today is on COVID-19 and sustainable development goal 13, that is climate change. So. Mm -hmm. The COVID-19 crisis has certainly had a wide range of environmental and economic consequences and, and has posed a major impact on the sustainable development. It has exposed an ambitious claim made in Agenda 2030 to address the poverty, hunger, and climate change. The global coronavirus pandemic has brought our way of life to almost a complete standstill. The three E's of sustainability, that is energy, equity, environment, in the framework of UN Sustainable Development Goals have been challenged. So the climate change has been a focal point for centuries, but at this period, the climate change could be is much more you know, relevant because although climate change has been much more gradual, but according to WHO, its effect could lead to approximately 250,000 deaths every year between 2030 and 2050. So the background of the crisis, we all know it is an infectious disease caused by SARS-CoV-2 yes, and it, is, really? it has been declared in the pandemic on 11th March, 2020. So the primary objective of my study is to explore the different role climate plays yeah, in this pandemic. And I have two specific roles also, which I'll be taking one by one. So methodology is a descriptive analytical review paper. The paper is based on secondary data collected from review of literatures, from journals, articles, surveys undertaken at different levels. The methodology involves in-depth discussions with scholars, professors, and other key stakeholders in various platforms. And the author's opinion is also included in this paper. So let us go to the discussion part. So we all know sustainability is the ability to exist constantly. Sustainable, we all know that there are 17 sustainable development goals and goal 13 is about the climate change. So let us look into the trajectory of climate crisis concern in the month preceding COVID-19. We know that New Delhi was ranked as the most polluted city by WHO in, in 2014, with generally the air quality index remains about 200 and during the peak pollution level, it goes to about 900. But as the lockdown started, it has fallen to below 20. So in the same way, particulate matter concentration has also decreased a lot. If in the global context also, we can see the global climate carbon dioxide emission has decreased a lot. In New York, it has decreased by 10% just in the month of March, and in Paris, it went down by 72%. But no one wanted carbon emission to be reduced this way. COVID-19 has a dark cost to our life, healthcare system, and to the mental health of the people around the world. An upper respiratory disease such as COVID-19, the quality of air in the area in which someone lives is bound to have an impact. And it has been said to the studies that mortality rates increase by approximately 15% to those people who stay in a most more polluted, air polluted areas. Now, 
if we look into the uh, pandemic situation influence, if this pandemic had any influence on the public attitude, we'll see that climate crisis is linked to an increased likelihood of pandemics, extreme weather conditions, drought, flooding, and widespread destabilization of global food economy and security system. Although it seems that climate crisis is taking a backseat in this global pandemic, but the crisis is evident and its long-term effect will, be, will take a more threatening turn. And the planet is already in a track of 3.2 degree global temperature rise and, and beyond. Okay, now this is a study uh, I have taken, I have already collected. So when people were asked to what extent they agree or to disagree on the government action prioritizing climate change after you know COVID-19 was founded, most of the people around the world, they feel they strongly agree or tend to agree that the government should prioritize action on climate change along with the economic recovery. But when it was asked of the following topics, which is the topic that you think is more worrying in the country, it is said that at present they feel that coronavirus 19 is the most worrying thing in the in their in their country. This is because probably because research shows that people not only respond much more decisively to immediate and tangible threats, but tend to exhibit avoidance uh, behavior for a, a future threat, no matter how potentially grave they are. So. So COVID-19 has been responsible for three out of every 1,000 deaths globally. But the World Health Organization now tracked that caused by drivers of global warming, namely black carbon, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, together with the ozone and carbon monoxide. And number is 8 million each year. That is 140 out of every 1,000 deaths globally is because of your the climate crisis that is about 46 times the proportion of the debt from global uh, COVID-19 at the global lockdown stage and we have just begun to feel the effect of climate change much more serious impact are projected for the future including ecosystem collapse or more extreme weather conditions sea level rise and so many so when the global COVID-19 is finally subsides and economics are likely to rebound with a vengeance burning more more cheaper fuel will take place. Asia's natural resources are likewise taking a hit with millions of unemployed day laborers returned to their villages and now relying heavily on the forest, local forests, rivers, oceans for the food and other basic needs. But the pandemic has given the nations to limit their global warming. As follow-up actions plans are formulated to help countries and communities rebuild their economics and societies post-pandemic, this will give an opportunity to embrace renewable technology, green technology, sustainable new sectors that will put the planet on a fast track path to decarbonization. If we look into the implications and recommendations for key industry players moving forward, we see that as we allocate huge resources for post COVID-19 economic recovery, we have an opportunity to make a paradigm shift. To tackle climate change, we need to be more transformation. We need to change the way we produce energy, the way we travel, the way we eat, the way we live. And that's not an enormous undertaking. We must ensure that huge economic stimulus packages that governments are designing to support economics, companies, and people during pandemic also tackle climate change. And I have, you know, rec uh, uh, towards coming to the conclusions, I have a few recommendations and the conclusions that I've come up is that firstly, we need to advance the delivery of 100% clean power and mobility. We know that our energy system can cope with an increased amount of renewable energy, and we already have uh, financially viable electric vehicles. So there is entirely, this is entirely achievable. Second, is increase building retrofitting to help reduce emission. This is, of course, a capital intensive activity and with unemployment, now it is an excellent time for companies to create jobs to reduce their buildings energy and water uses by making modification to improve their performance. Third, when re rescuing companies through bailouts, government must outline specific conditions to minimize those companies' negative impact on climate change. So why hasn't the world responded to climate change with anything resembling the speed of response and political will it has demonstrated for battling the coronavirus? Of course, the question remains. So these are the references that I've used and thank you. Thank you, sir.
हेलो थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर पिंकी फॉर योर नाइस प्रेजेंटेशन एक्सपेशली फोकसिंग ऑन क्लाइमेट चेंज प्लीज Go ahead with your presentation. Yeah, Dr. Sharma. Oh, no. This is the last presentation for today, but not the least. Very important. COVID nineteen on the FMCG sector. Yeah, FMCG. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, good yes. afternoon, everybody present here. Uh, I am Dr. Rajasmita Sharma. I am going to present a joint paper on impact of COVID-19 on the FMC sector in India and analysis. Uh, the first women consumer goods, that is FMCG, are the first selling perishable consumer goods which have short shelf life either because of the nature of these goods or for their high demands. They sell at relatively low cost. They are the na of nature of frequent use, so as to that consumer have to. Buy these products at least once in a month. FMCG products mainly include toiletries, detergents, pharmaceutical products, packaged soft drinks, packaged food products, etc. FMCG industry is the fourth largest sector in the Indian economy. Now, the goods sold under FMCG mainly may be classified under three major heads: household and personal care products that accounts for 50 percent. Healthcare products, which accounts for 31 to 32 percent, and the rest, food and beverages, for 18 to 19 percent. So the objective of my study is to examine the effect of COVID-19 on the FMCG sector in India and to suggest measures for the growth of this industry in the post-COVID period. So the research methodology uh, taken up here is of descriptive in nature. And the uh, data from secondary sources are used for the study. As we know, the advent of COVID-19 has created a havoc in the global FMCG market. The impact of this pandemic is so big that almost 195 countries across the world has entered into recession, paving the way to the next global recession. In spite of the measures taken by the dif by different governments to contain this outbreak, it seems that it will take some time before everything returns to normalcy. Now, these measures taken to contain this outbreak, like lockdown, social distance, etc., are affecting the FMCG industry to a great extent. As we know, in India, this uh, lockdown and social distancing they started from uh, March. now because of these lockdowns uh, these fmcg companies they are facing mainly logistic issues lack of required labor force they have to restrict their production only to essential items and there is also total disruption of supply chain as we know the fmcg fmcg products the, the fmcg industry is facing difficulty but Uh, there is a thing that uh, some of the products they are they are showing unprecedented hike in sales, like packaged food item, health drink, immunity booster food item, hand sanitizer, floor cleaner products. Because we know this is because of the panic bu panic buying on the part of the masses, and also for the health and hygiene factor. Again, similarly, downward trend is seen in the sale of cosmetics and color materials. we know people are not going out much and they are also not anticipating public gatherings in near future now we know that uh, this fmcg companies they are uh, mainly sold through three channels traditional way modern way and e trade now this traditional trade uh, is facing the most difficult then followed by modern trade then e trade now this fmcg companies uh, fmcg products they reach the customers from manufacturer through a series of intermediate steps now because of this disruption in supply chain this companies finding it difficult to reach to the customers 
So what they'll have to do, they'll have to abolish these intermediate steps in the supply chain, and they'll have to try to reach to the customers directly. For that, the companies are partnering with ride-hailing services like Swiggy, Danzo, Zometo, Rapido, etc., so that their sales increase or they can reach the customers directly. Again, most of the FMCG companies, they are shifting to e-commerce platform because people nowadays like to get the essential delivered at their doorstep. And this is also essential to stick to safety protocols, uh, adhere to safety protocol, of course. And many previously successful products in the market are losing prevalence because uh, people, a section of the people has uh, less uh, purchasing capacity now, again, uh, because of social stigma, that is also another reason. And brands are now fighting to remain consumer relevant. So the findings of my study are, it was seen that FMCG sector is hardly hit by the outbreak of COVID-19, in spite of being thought of as recession proof. Essential items like packaged food, grocery, and health and hygiene products are witnessing unprecedented demand during pandemic. But here is one thing, though these things are selling at a high rate, especially the food items, uh, this is not going to stay forever. Once the people pile up, they will uh, stop buying. And obviously there is a gloomy future ahead. The disruption in manufacturing units and supply of products for panic buyers dry up the inventory among the retailers, which will affect the supply chain again. FMCG companies are seen to be partnering with ride hailing services to reach consumer directly. Uh, though this seems to be a temporary measure, it seems that it may altogether change the distributor relationship, uh, distributor wholesaler relationship in the near future. Shifting of business to ETLOF platform is another important aspect to survive in this pandemic period. The companies will have to analyze data regarding customer behavior to make them future ready. So ultimately, the suggestions here are, it is the responsibility of the government and the telecom companies to expand the digital platform throughout the country so that this FMCG companies, they can reach the people living in remotest areas and the growth is equal all over. New collaborations and partnerships are to be formed in the order to match the supply to the demand. And companies need to utilize their IT system well to analyze consumer data and in order to leverage this crisis. So I would like to conclude that the biggest need of the hour for these FMCG companies is to accept change in the market and try to adapt to modern trading. The internet is going to be the biggest and the most popular platform for business in future and current shift of business to this platform is a step towards it. Companies will have to embrace this change, especially in their supply chain. They have to form new collaborations and partnerships in order to match the supply to the demand. The bottom line here is that companies must leverage IT systems to analyze and predict data regarding consumer behavior and try forming solutions to its problems based on it. So these are my references. Yes. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sarma, for your presentation, uh, comprehensive presentation, uh, COVID-19, uh, FM, uh, CG, right? Sector in yes. India is quite new. Uh, thank you all. Okay. I think we have now finished up all the pre presentations. No. Hello, sir. Uh, sir. Yes. Do Dr. Dinesh, please. Yes, sir. Yeah, sir. One more again. One more. I'm, I'm here, sir. Last one. Last please. one. Last one. Am, Abdul, okay. Abdul Kudos. 15 okay. one. Okay, okay, please. Okay. Yes, sir. I am here to present my please. paper, sir. Okay, please. Yeah. Why? Honorable. Dr. Ramsharan Patak sir from Srifan University, Nepal, all other guest speaker from different look and corner of the world, and our host, Dr. Dinesh Darsan. Sir, I'm a research scholar. My topic is COVID-19 and its impact on the court, advocate, and the litigant. Mm -hmm. Introduction. On the eve, eve of the November and December 2019, the province of Wuhan, China, alerted the World Health Organization of several flu-like cases 
Less than a week later, a novel coronavirus was identified. In February, the disease it caused named was COVID-19. The symptom of the COVID coronavirus was dangerously similar to that of common flu, fever, coughing, breathlessness, tiredness, headache, muscle pain. But very recently, two new symptoms are also added. One is loss of taste, another is loss of smell. The earth never tested the situation wherein developed countries is begging for medicine and remedies. Most powerful state helplessly and silently bears the death of their death of their human resources. Advocates are always depends upon the daily court functioning and yeah, justice seeker, yeah. justice seeker, yeah. litigant people also does the same for early justice. Literature review of my research paper is that print media, electronic media are the core base of my data collection. International, national, and regional, regional papers has been playing a vital role to update the news of the coronavirus. Letters to the Honorable Prime Minister of India and Honorable Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of India are also materialized the oasis of my research paper. Notification and guidelines of the Supreme Court of India and Guwahati High Court also played a vital role to fulfill the data collection. Objective of my research paper, to study the COVID-19 and its symptoms, to study the challenges of identification and isolation, to study the challenges of testing and treatment, and lastly, to study the impact of COVID-19 on court advocate and, and litigant. Methodology of my study is that, the research, the research that has been conducted is empirical one. It includes a study of the legal documents, United Nations publication related to the COVID-19, publications and documents of the international and national organization, journals, case law, and research paper. Discussion. Long 68 days total lockdown paralyzed the day-to-day -day life of the people. The court almost ceased to functioning for which advocate community and litigant people has been suffering badly. Particularly, men under suspension matter of subsistence allowance, transparent promotion matter, matter related to the check disbursement for the people who died in motor accident and the person seriously injured causing amputation of limb and permanent disablement are suffering badly. The proverb, Justice delayed is justice denied become true. The research article is contemporary study upon the COVID-19, a real challenge for the world community. At present, the topics become more important agenda and burning issues of the world. Though COVID-19 touches each and every sphere of human life, but financially except government, servant, all other affected. More affected groups are the person who always depends upon the daily income. But most affected educated specialist is advocate community. Lacks of the litigants, thousands of the advocate and hundreds of the petition writer, typists and vendors has been living on the daily income. Except judge, magistrate and the co-staff who are receiving full monthly salary, whether court is functioning regularly or not, doesn't matter. Honorable Guwahati High Court, by notification number 18, dated 24th March 2020, announced the matter which are already fixed and listing for hearing in the district and session court up to 4th 4, 4, 2020 shall stand deferred uh, unless extreme urgency is shown for immediate hearing of the matter. Bar Association are the institution who is, uh, wherein advocates are the member. Advocates are governed by the Advocates Act 1961, uh, with its apex governing body, Bar Council of India. But why even maintaining social distancing and wearing masks, advocate cannot open their bar. Even an illiterate shopkeeper in, uh, in all market, even a bench assistant, peon, are working, sitting on their chair. Advocates are attending the court, standing in front of the locked bar association for which huge gathering of the advocates and litigants increase the possibility of spreading coronavirus. Honorable Chairperson of Bar Council of India, Mannan Kumar Mishra, 
wrote a letter to the Honorable Prime Minister and all other chief ministers of all the state on 24-3-2020, begging for financial assistance. Findings of my research paper. Public gathering has a risk for spreading of coronavirus. A strict observation of all health guidelines can help to curb corona. Life and livelihood should go equally to save the humanity. Total closure of bar association is ultra-virus. Bar association should be open with the strict compliance of the corona guideline. Conclusion. As the COVID-19 takes hold the world in its grip, the whole community should formulate foolproof policy to curb its effect. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. I think all the presentations are over, right? Dr. Uh, yes, sir, yes, sir. Yes. Okay, presentations, uh, now yeah. over now for today. No, well, sir, all have yeah. done uh, very good. Uh, all have done very good. Uh, all fifteen presenters, right, uh, uh, covering uh, 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 various sectors, could be economic sector, agricultural sectors. Uh, even uh, we have uh, a friend from South Africa, right? Uh, uh, presented paper here, uh, Southern Africa, Kapeshu, uh, Devi, and uh, Ashwini uh, on poverty, uh, mineral. Wow, what is this? Money, 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 Rega. Oh, this is new for me actually. So that was also a paper on money, Rega, COVID 19 from Jabir and uh, Sir Himire from Kathmandu. He is my student, you know, uh, food crisis. He also presented a paper here. Uh, Sir Himire, uh, Dipanjali, good paper on general implications. Uh, all have good papers here. Dr. Mani Risha, Dr. Jayasri, Indraini, Dr. Pinky. Sarma and so on. So all, all have done well, actually nice presentation, prepared well and finished it off in the uh, uh, given time. Uh, uh, I can still see there are more than 200 attendees are there in the platform. Uh, it's good, 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 good attendance. And I uh, hope the, uh, you will, you are, your presenters will be awarded, I think, uh, once uh, they will get ebook after as well. Uh, I think uh, you have to, uh, be, uh, be attentive, uh, attendance is compulsory, I can see uh, uh, in a note uh, from Dr. Dinesh. So certificate, e-books, uh, you, you will be getting uh, soon, I think after the uh, uh, conference is over. So actually, uh, at last, uh, but not the least, uh, uh, this is second day of the conference. Uh, we must uh, congratulate uh, the organizer, Dr. Dinesh. Uh, this the heavy rain and so on and so on this morning uh, was very terrible. Yeah, it's, he managed, yeah. <laughs> the, the, the organizer managed and uh, now uh, it, uh, the, the program went smoothly the second day despite uh, the problem. So I think uh, we will have uh, uh, tomorrow the last uh, day of the uh, conference, right? Uh, so, but that, that will be in the afternoon, right? 4 p.m., something like that. That will, tomorrow will be in the afternoon. Good Friday also, so we'll have program at around 4 p.m. 3:55 something like that. Yeah, 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 so it's right. Yeah. We have to say goodbye. So, 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 thank you, thank you, Dr. Dilis, for organizing uh, this uh, conference. Uh, it's not a joke, you know. It's very difficult. Actually, we have managed. Uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you all. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, sir, for your kind support. Now we are coming to the last agenda. Vote of thanks. Yeah. So, yeah. So I would like to request uh, uh, Miss Pionka Setri, Assistant Professor of Economics, Gosayo College, to deliver her vote of thanks. Yes. Pionka. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm sir. Yeah. 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 You go ahead. Namaste and good afternoon, everyone. Honorable Chairperson of both the sessions and honorable guest, guest speakers of both the sessions and uh, our respected participants. So after completing two long sessions, now here we have come to an end of this today, second day of the national conference. So on behalf of the organizing committee, 
first of all i would like to thank to our first chairperson of the first session dr shilu jin upane ma'am so though she is not present now but ma'am thank you for your time for giving us your valuable time at the same time i would like to thank to professor ram sharan pathak sir sir thank you for giving your precious time and thank you for bearing us for so long sir and at the same time i would like to thank you for giving for making this session interesting and informative one <coughs> again i would like to thank to professor edwin for his valuable and resourceful presentation and again i would like to thank to professor srimal for his presentation and showing us the economic scenario of the globe during this pandemic last but not the least i would like to thank to all the presenters and participants for bearing us so long time thank you all we will meet you again tomorrow thank you thank you so much Thank you, Priyanka. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Now we are going to end the program. So I would like to again thank you all for your kind cooperation and resourceful information. And today is the second day of the international seminar. Then we are going to tomorrow. That is the last one. So, I hope we will meet tomorrow again uh, with these few words. I once again uh, thank you to all, and I conclude this uh, session here from today. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye and namaste. 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 Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go.